Our second conversation today, um, oh, I'm Alyssa Anderson, and our second conversation today centers on exploring contemporary practices in architectural publications, uh, asking how current publication projects are operating as sites of and stimuli for critical production and exchange. The shifts that we've been thinking about here are grounded first in the particularities of architectural discourse. Uh, for example, the relationship between text and image, the implications of different modes of writing, and the construction of argument versus the project of description. Um, in addition, we're also concerned with the unstable shifting conditions facing all of today's publishers, editors, and writers in this, our alleged current era of the death of print, the shortening of readers' attention spans, and the Twitterfication of criticism. Um, we're honored to have three very exciting editors with us here today whose diverse approaches to the publication platform offer us the opportunity to focus in on their individual practices, as well as to widen the scope of our investigation to interrogate what their work and what their convictions about the operation of the architectural editor might evidence. Um, personally, um, as a bit of an amateur geologist, <laughs> when I think of shift, I'm thinking of it very literally in terms of plate tectonics or earthquakes. Um, so as I was sitting here listening to our earlier panel, um, I was kind of thinking of our three speakers um, as a seismograph in a way. And <laughs> we have our three needles and, um, and as the conversation is going, I'm, I'm wondering if there is going to be a jump, um, maybe all at the same time, um, and, and what those jumps of the needle might indicate about underlying energies or forces or something moving that's, that's moving them. Um, so I guess we'll see. <laughs> um, first, we're going to hear from New York's own Cynthia Davidson, a critic and former editor of Inland Architect, founder and editor of Any Magazine and the Any Book series, and founder and editor of her current project, Log. Cynthia, I think, in many ways, uh, offers us a revealing reading of the forces and energies of editorial practice as we've moved from the 20th century into the 21st. Um, after Cynthia, we'll hear from Matteo Guidoni, who came from Milan to join us today. Um, he's an architect, publisher, and editor-in-chief of San Rocco Magazine, a collaborative project involving many team members and many more contributors. Uh, the magazine's central impulse we can perhaps frame today as the move to shift the architecture magazine back toward architecture. We'll, we'll see what he says about that. And finally, we're going to hear from Justin McGurk, a London-based writer, critic, curator, and former editor of Icon Magazine and design critic at The Guardian, whose current editorial project, The Radical Publishing House Strelka Press, is exploring what the long-form essay and emerging digital distribution models, excuse me, can do for architectural and design discourse. Um, I honestly can't wait to hear what all of them have to say, so without further ado, uh, we'll hear from Cynthia Davidson. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Felicity, Mark, Mark, etc., etc. Uh, don't want to waste time. Um, I do. I will say, um, though, uh, before I begin, um, what fun it is to be here today with Matteo and and Justin, uh, because I am such a print person. I was just telling Justin. As far as I can tell, I may be old enough to be some of your grandmothers. I can't tell. Uh, but Justin is the reason I now have an iBook account. Just because of what he's been doing at Strelka, I had to get Pierre Vittorio Aureli's uh, extended essay book that, that he published at Strelka. So thank you for bringing me into the 21st century. Um, but uh, if you can see this, uh, I didn't really know how to uh, think about critical shifts because when you're in publishing, as I have been my entire career, um, 
you're just looking at the now and you're not necessarily thinking about shifting. And so for me, I could only think about shifts in hindsight, hence 80s, 90s, aughts, uh, because, and then we'll see if I have time left at the end to see if there's any uh, perceptible tremors, shall we say, uh, in the landscape of log. Uh, I have uh, edited uh, three different magazines. The first one I fell into by accident. I've actually edited a fourth, which was in contemporary art, which led to architecture. Inland Architect in Chicago for eight years, um, or I lived there for eight years, I did Inland Architect for seven years, I did any magazine for seven years, and I've done log now for 11 years, uh, which is probably four years too long. Uh, when I think about these in hindsight, uh, in terms of shifts, I think about the 80s as really having been the, the sort of peak uh, of the discussion about postmodernism in architecture. Was postmodernism a, a way of thinking, a way of thinking critically about modernity? Was it a style? Because we were based in Chicago, there was a lot of discussion about style, working in the shadow of Mies, what does it mean to have Stanley Targerman doing a uh, veterinary shelter that looks like a dog? Um, you know, the duck versus the decorated shed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there were things going on in, in the 80s, and I don't know if it was because we were rethinking modernity or there was something new in the air about architecture. I've never really investigated this. But right after I became editor of Inland Architect in 1983, or right before I became editor, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago had opened a uh, department of architecture and design. It was only the second museum in the United States to open such a department, the first having been MoMA. So do the math, there were a lot of decades that went by where nobody really thought about architecture and the museum in the United States. The discussion about postmodernism, of course, extended to built buildings. This is Cohn, Peterson, Fox, is really elegant yet controversial building in Chicago because this elegant glass tower, which now had a new shape, it wasn't Miesian, shall we say, in the way that Mies built in Chicago. It was green, et cetera, but it also had a very articulated stone base, which was this very controversial uh, discussion in Chicago. So the magazine was really just responding to what was going on. We get to 1988, we get to Bernard Schumi's uh, La Villette uh, project, and of course the Decon show at MoMA. Um, and one begins to see in hindsight that yes, there are real shifts going on. Uh, this also coincided with a shift in my own personal life, which was definitely perceptible. Uh, I left Chicago and came to New York and was one of the four co-founders of the Anyone Project. Uh, since we've been talking about money and names, uh, in the first panel I should say we were incorporated as a not-for-profit in the state of New York, which the lawyers made us call a corporation. So the Anyone Corporation, which does absolutely nothing corporate whatsoever, uh, has a, a hands-off board of directors, uh, no, uh, well, we can talk about salary, that's a whole other problem. Money, let's just say, is not uh, something that's easy to come by. The Anyone Project was set up to do a 10-year project uh, on the undecidability of architecture at the end of the millennium, really kind of a mouthful when you think about it now and something we sort of erase in hindsight and just say, well, it was really about undecidability, the century was going to change, so for 10 years we were going to have a cross-cultural, multidisciplinary conversation about architecture, and that architecture would be the host, so that theorists like Fred Jameson, uh, philosophers and literary critics uh, like Mark Taylor or Kojin Karatani, uh, from all over the world would participate in discussions that uh, could be seen as emanating or originating in architecture, uh, whether they were hierarchies, uh, spatial, et cetera. Um, we did these 10 events, uh, 10 books, 
there were perhaps 25, 28 people that spoke at each of these two and a half day events, each in a different city around the world. And those events made us realize because one a year was not enough, we really should start a magazine as well. And that this magazine would be thematic and would not respond to the cultural uh, milieu that was around us, but rather would activate that milieu that, <laughs> I mean, all these terms that are, are being said this morning uh, or this afternoon in the first session, such as archive and record, even what the, the program uh, editors and writers in the book they've just launched uh, were using, I suppose I could apply every single one of those terms to what any magazine was in itself. Uh, but we didn't think of it that way. We thought of it as a tabloid that was gonna be quick, that it was gonna activate, that it was gonna put events out and then record those events and put them in magazines to distribute to a broader audience. It was a pretty simple, straightforward, not complicated idea. We didn't overthink it, let's say. Um, so seaside uh, and politics, not something you really would think about uh, as part of an undecidability project, shall we say, since Duane and Plater Zyberg seemed quite decided as to what their agenda was. But there were ideas about architecture embedded in that project and very political ideas. Uh, Mark Taylor, the philosopher of religion, uh, was very early on embed, uh, involved in the digital project, uh, in particular how the digital would affect education in the future. Uh, really a man thinking ahead of his time because I think we still haven't caught up to what Mark was thinking about. But in 1994, he, put, he did an issue called Electrotecture, coining this term as a way of thinking about the virtual and the digital that was going to happen to architecture. This is back when we were in chat rooms uh, or in an online uh, space called The Well that you could rent to, uh, time on in order to have conversations with people in other places. But the idea was, what does this mean for architecture? I mean, in 94, Alacare Stone, Avital Ronell, different people were coming together and saying, what does this mean about space? Uh, is architecture going to lose the sort of, um, lose its dominance of the idea of space? Is that important? Is that not important? Is the virtual going to take from architecture, et cetera, et cetera? So there were things going on, uh, but not going on. Uh, the fax machine. Who even has a fax machine now? All of a sudden, a global practice was possible because we had fax machines. Uh, John Reichman, um, who I worked with very closely throughout the whole 10 years on this project, uh, did two uh, issues with me. This is one that's called Lightness, which was thinking about not just architecturally light, what does that mean, lightness in terms of the architectural, uh, for him, it meant Zanakis' uh, and Korb's Phillips Pavilion, but also what, is, what does it mean structurally, what does it mean conceptually. So we were always uh, exploring different ideas, bringing different parties together to the table. This issue was not just about architecture, but also philosophy, and dance. And then, uh, if you notice here, there's a kind of a change in the look of the magazine, and I wanted to take just a moment to talk about um, representation or image, and uh, uh, particularly since Aaron was talking about the sort of changeability of the Slot Foundation's uh, logo, that it was designed to actually take form, change form. The original designer of the Any Books and Magazine was Massimo Vignelli, uh, because we had no money to pay a designer. Uh, he said, I'll make you a template. You know, you use Helvetica, and East Century Expanded, warm red, my, my fonts, my colors. It's what Massimo does uh, and always says classically. And then one day somebody, Stephen Harris and Deborah Burke said to me, you know, you need your own identity. Vignelli's too uh, attached with the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, with Skyline, with oppositions, all the things they produced. <clears throat> And so I discovered Michael Rock and Susan Sellers, who became two by four. Uh, this was our first project together. And I show you just the difference between uh, Vignelli and, and two by four, because I think this was a, a critical shift in graphic design. And the graphic design is uh, really critical uh, when you're 
doing a print publication. I mean, how something is packaged, what its image is, uh, how people think about it, how they recognize it, how they find it, how they collect it, how they display it, why they throw it away, <clears throat> has as much to do with the object. And I'm interested in that object because I'm interested in paper, and paper creates an object, right? Uh, different kind of object, I mean, archived differently, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this at least begins to show that we had a different identity, that we were uh, moving away from the, uh, shall we say, more decidable <coughs> or, or clarity of the modern project that, that Vignelli had always um, aspired to, and that we, things were now much more layered, much more subtle, uh, sometimes even difficult to read, uh, not because of the writing, <laughs> but because of the graphics. Uh, these are just a few pages from the Kuhlhaas issue that uh, uh, that Two by Four did. I might mention, since we were talking about MoMA earlier, that uh, this issue was done as the unofficial catalog of the OMA show at MoMA in 1994 uh, that Terry Riley did, uh, because the, the whole show was done so quickly uh, that they didn't even do much more than a kind of little newsprint thing. Uh, so this is the catalog, unofficial catalog. Just a couple of other covers that uh, Two by Four did, and to give you some sense of the kinds of um, things that we were both, we were in part responding to current events and in part uh, going beyond current events. The public fear issue was not long after the Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing, which of course was not a whole lot longer after the first World Trade Center bombing in New York. Uh, there was a bombing of a, of a Jewish center in Buenos Aires. And all of this had an immediate uh, reverberation in the practice of architecture. I mean, how do we make things bomb-proof? What kind of new requirements are we gonna have? And I've always been really interested in building uh, not just in thinking and how do, when we think about building, what does that mean and, and, and how does our thinking then affect building? And obviously public fear, the sort of general audience and the general population has an impact. Um, the diagram was very architectural, very much about architecture itself and how it's generated. Public fear I did with Tony Vidler and it really moved away from the, the need to uh, reinforce the ground floors of buildings just to more of the explorations of agoraphobia, acrophobia, xenophobia, et cetera. These different kinds of phobias that came, uh, came to be recognized with the growth of the modern city. I think what was important about the ENI project is that it was a finite project. I don't believe it would have uh, succeeded had it had we said you know we're just going to start doing these conferences uh, the fact that we set out at the beginning and said there are only going to be 10 conferences um, in 10 cities because there's only 10 compound any words in the English language dictionary and then we're done it made it a little bit like the Olympics cities were actually competing to have an any conference uh, and that to get the sort of core uh, group of people who who always were there uh, Fred Jamison, Mark Taylor, John Reichman, um, Peter Eisenman, Arata Isosaki, Rem Kuhas, people that I, quote unquote, was supposed to deliver. Um, when I didn't deliver, the local people were always really upset. So there was a bit of a curatorial problem there, you might say, uh, curating people who are unreliable. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it worked out. Uh, and when the conference itself was over, literally the funding was over, which meant this magazine was over, which meant this writing architecture series books was also over. This was started uh, in 95. Um, the first series of books went up to Elizabeth Gross on the second row, and uh, that came out in 2001 when everything sort of stopped. I was gonna close the Anyone Corporation because it had a, a lousy name and it was really, really hard to fund. Nobody in the United States wanted to fund a magazine that was primarily concerned with theory. 
Uh, all the money I got to do any magazine came from abroad. Uh, I didn't even get a National Endowment for the Arts grant except for the very last any conference which was held in New York City. So I took a sort of sabbatical. Then the World Trade Center went down and they had a design competition and it was an extraordinary uh, outpouring of images, what could this be? And I felt that there was such a proliferation of image and response to image that there wasn't enough conversation about the concepts and ideas that were behind the images. And so I thought, I'm gonna have to start another magazine. I'm gonna start a magazine that resists the seductive power of the image so that we can get behind the image and really talk about the ideas that are behind it. So I used as my model the literary magazine McSweeney's because I wanted a magazine uh, that was about writing. I'm really keenly interested in writing. It's the one sort of overriding uh, concern of mine that's gone through all three projects. I have never shifted from my interest in writing. So the idea behind Log was not that there was a shift in my thinking or that there was a cultural shift, but that we had moved from the sort of undecidability uh, and the, the whole Deleuzean, De, uh, De, Deridian and Deleuzean thinking in the, in, the, in the 90s into really a digital age. And this was going to impact architecture. And what was that going to be? We didn't know, hence the name log, like a ship's log where the captain is making observations and simply not saying anything is clear. So in other words, it's, it's not a ground that's shifting, it's a sea that's rolling, shall we say. Um, the idea was that to resist the seductive power of the image, the, the cover became a postcard, uh, that when you unwrapped it, the image fell off and you were left with writing, you were left with a cover story. It doesn't mean we're against images, it just means we're trying to use images in a different way than they are proliferated in mass media or that they are proliferated in the magazines that feature newness or that are proliferated on the internet. We've also had some guest editors who have either axes to grind or proposals, uh, propositions to make who would like to see certain kinds of cultural shifts, shall we say. Uh, Sarah Whiting and Bob Somo on the projective in architecture, Mark Gage and Florencia Pita on uh, ideas about the digital. I did shift the colors of the covers in order to keep uh, public, public interest, shall we say. Uh, occasional guest edited issues, such as this one, uh, not guest, but thematic issues. Uh, Tina DiCarlo actually worked with me on this one, on, on curating architecture. And then taking, uh, taking the magazine a little bit back into the public sphere so that we could also have public discussions. Um, the, this is an article of, uh, about a uh, event we did last fall at the, at the Museum of Modern Art on Log's 10th anniversary um, called In Pursuit of Architecture, where I brought together 10, <coughs> ten architects and four critics to see if they could talk to each other. Uh, they couldn't. Um, it was really interesting. It was really interesting to see which architects uh, are completely uninterested in theory. These architects all had to be under the age of 59. They were chosen by submitting a single project, which uh, we then uh, selected 10 so-called winners. Uh, their prize was to come to New York and perform. Uh, uh, but it elicited um, writing from people who'd been there, uh, and there were more than 400 people there, that I didn't expect that came back at us, kind of like the wave comes to the shore and then rolls back on you. And, and uh, be it began to identify perhaps what some of the critical point, talking points are in architecture today. Well, what, happened? what did I do? There was only one more. Sorry. 
Um, I'm, I'm just going to leave you with, with the, the hmm? if he gets it, it, it's not important, it's, it's just a kind of wall of log, uh, but it's, it's a very tentative wall. It's, it's a wall that any one of you could break, yeah, that, that. It's, uh, any one of you could break through um, and knock over, um, stuff this in an archive. <laughs> Uh, but what my, my philosophy has always been in doing a magazine is to surprise you, to try in every single issue in order to keep uh, some level of interest to put something unexpected so that when you open up the issue and you look at the table of contents or you look at the back page or you flip through, you say, whoa, I, I didn't realize this or I never thought of it in this way. I despise market market research, um, uh, I despise voting, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> um, I despise uh, uh, the democratic, the democracy, uh, or this movement of democracy uh, over the expertise of the critic. Um, I shouldn't say despise, it's a bit strong. <laughs> but uh, I do not think the age of the expert is over, and I don't believe anyone in this room thinks it's over either, or you would not be in graduate school, you would not be at this event. You want to know what it takes to be better, to be smarter, to be faster, and perhaps to implement shifts. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And now we'll hear from Matteo Guidoni. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, from Milan. Um, I'm really honored, really proud to be here with, uh, discussing with a bunch of people that I really admire for their work. And I will talk about one project, uh, it is San Rocco, San Rocco magazine, is this, this object, basically. And here you have the, the first of the covers that we produced, and here you have the last one. And uh, I must say that uh, the format didn't change since the beginning. Uh, it was born as uh, this kind of object, weighing uh, more or less 200 grams, uh, 21 by 17 centimeters in size. Uh, I don't know in, in inches. Uh, sorry, I, I cannot uh, <laughs> make the, the translation now. Um, it's, uh, it's printed uh, in, in black and white mainly. Uh, it has a very small part of it uh, in color, so we have to, and that, that is for economical reasons mainly. Uh, so we have to carefully uh, choose the images that we want to publish in color and where to place them. Um, it's, uh, it's printed on, on matte paper. Uh, it only has a glossy cover with a, with a silk screen uh, print. Um, and it costs 15 euros. And it's, uh, uh, it's a magazine that uh, was, um, it was born in Italy. Um, it's a monographic magazine about architecture. It's independent and it's uh, distributed worldwide, also independently. Uh, it's written in English. Uh, the, um, the number of copies is uh, 3,000 uh, for each uh, issue. And uh, it, its uh, its finances are based on selling the copies. I mean, uh, we we have uh, uh, an average number of five pages pages of advertisement that is normally non-paid, and so uh, all we all we sell uh, contributes to the to to the life of the magazine. Only recently we had uh, a grant from the Graham Foundation uh, for the Fine Arts and we are really glad about it. So, um, I will briefly talk about uh, the magazine and the issues that came out, that I, but I wanted to focus on, 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 on three subjects, on three topics that uh, are, I think, at the core of our, 
of our magazine. So it's collaboration, copies, and call for papers. Not necessarily in this order, but uh, it seemed very nice to uh, make the homage to your uh, program. <laughs> so it's our CCCP. Um, so the first issue is uh, innocence. Um, well, I, what, I, what I did not say is that uh, um, the, the magazine was born uh, in practically in the summer 2010. We presented it at the first, uh, uh, the first issue at the Biennale of Architecture, entering from the back door, let's say. Um, but uh, it, it, there was a period of uh, almost one and a half year of uh, uh, elaboration of this, uh, of this idea when we had uh, meetings, uh, uh, all the producers of the magazine that actually is a, a collaborative project. Um, and uh, it's made by architects, so by practicing architects mainly. And these architects were, were um, spread around Venezia, Milan, uh, Rome. And then you have, we had also a graphic designer from Milan, uh, another uh, office in Genova, and another uh, photographer in, Tia, in Trieste. So we had the very, this very uh, loose talks, and finally we met in Venezia. We decided that we, that we are going to find, find the magazine, and, uh, and we start from there. Uh, among all the discussion, about uh, what to do, how to begin. We wanted to find the, the first uh, topic, and the topic finally was innocence, because we wanted to start with a certain degree of innocence, also because San Rocco name um, is in itself, uh, let's say, uh, for, for us, the example of uh, an innocent attempt uh, to work with architecture. In fact, uh, it's related to the name of uh, a project by Aldo Rossi and Giorgio Grassi that they did together in Monza in 1971. And uh, it was this, uh, that a project for a competition that then was not, not realized. Uh, uh, there were housing, normally, normal, ordinary housing blocks were built in, instead. And, uh, uh, but it was uh, this very, very, heroic, uh, innocent attempt to work together, to try to work together within the, the two architects' own differences, trying uh, to make a, a common project. And uh, somehow the project was not successful, it was a failure, but uh, um, it, uh, it shown us a possible way to, to collaborate. And uh, we chose the White U by Toyo Ito as a let's say the symbol of our, uh, our first issue because uh, also it's an example of an architecture that uh, um, suggests uh, uh, the, uh, a possible Ito that is different from the Ito we know today, you know, the, the, the heavy classic uh, concrete uh, Ito uh, against uh, the light Ito, the, the um, uh, steel and uh, and glass uh, and, uh, and, and architecture that can somehow fly. And also because this story is a sad story about uh, an architect uh, building for, for, for his uh, um, sister and the two daughters that ended very, in a very dramatic way. The, the, then the house was uh, uh, destroyed. Um, there is a whole story about uh, architects building houses for sisters that uh, then went in a sort of bad, bad way. You know, think about uh, Wittgenstein, uh, think about uh, Thomas Bernard Correcture, and so on. Um, what we wanted to do was uh, to try to make a magazine uh, in which we could talk about architecture with a fitting language. Uh, either textual, uh, photographic, or graphic, in a in a sort of re relevant way, uh, to go back to the condition of uh, possibility of talking about architecture in itself, not because we wanted to isolate it from uh, from the world, not because we want to push any idea of uh, uh, absoluteness of architecture or uh, uh, autonomy of uh, of architecture but because uh, we, we felt a great uh, uh, dissatisfaction, a great disappointment towards uh, the current condition of architectural uh, 
publishing, I, I, I'll go through the images, uh, um, simply because they, at least in Italy, uh, but I think uh, it's uh, more or less the same around the world uh, with few exceptions, uh, and I think a couple of them uh, are for sure represented here uh, today. Um, the magazines, um, pu publishing, uh, publications in general started to talk about everything. They started to talk about lifestyle, about, uh, um, about economics, about uh, geography, about poli uh, politics and so on. And all this has to do with architecture. We are sure about it. We, we, we are perfectly conscious about it. But uh, we think there is still a space um, to talk about architecture with, uh, uh, with a precise language, with, uh, uh, with the, the possibility of using uh, the tools that we are educated uh, um, in to talk about architecture. So the tools of the drawing, the tools of uh, writing and so on. And writing can be very, texts uh, that are contained in Sarocco are very different in, in style, let's say. Uh, they range from academic ones to, uh, to more, to, uh, to ironic, to um, kind of texts that are more uh, um, close, to, close to the popular culture. And uh, this depends on the contributors, but uh, in a way they, they really try to, to, to focus on architectural subject and all the time defining a frame uh, for, for a um, discussion. Um, this was the, the, the third issue, number two, because the first was zero, then one, two. Uh, the even covering of the field tried to deal with, uh, uh, with a sort of contemporary condition uh, in which uh, there is no distinction anymore be between figure uh, and ground because uh, we are uh, immersed in a to totally un anthropized uh, environment. So uh, architecture and landscape and nature and production uh, and uh, artificialized nature all coexist uh, in, a, in a single big, everything is background, let's say, uh, almost for 90% of the world. So we wanted to investigate with the, uh, this condition and we, we, we took this expression that is not ours expression, but the even covering of the field was, in, was let's say, uh, um, an expression that was invented by uh, Colonel Creswell when uh, there was uh, an English colonel in, uh, um, based uh, in Egypt uh, when uh, he analyzed for the first time um, uh, the ma Muslim architecture and, uh, and uh, the mosque's uh, architecture in particular. He described them as the even covering of the field. Uh, this is a beautiful drawing by Sam Jacobs that he produced uh, for the magazine. Uh, so the, the, <coughs> the contributions for the magazine have uh, a very different, uh, uh, use a very different set of, uh, of techniques. Uh, we have text, but we, we also have uh, uh, drawings specifically produced for the magazine. Models, we have seen a model of Fort Boyard for the for the issue about islands that was produced by Monadnock, uh, an office based in, uh, in the Netherlands, and then uh, photographed by Bas Perinsen. Here we have these drawings by San Jacob. Then we published an issue on mistakes. Um, the kind of mistakes we are interested in, of course, they are um, architectural mistakes that could have a really far uh, origin, like uh, the pyramid of Snefru that uh, you can imagine this pyramid that was built and then at a certain point they suddenly realized that uh, the, the angle of, uh, of the sides was uh, too uh, big and uh, they needed to change the angle suddenly, so it, uh, this kind of mistake produced this incredible example of a unique uh, pyramid. Uh, so, um, and or also this uh, wonderful uh, corner solution of uh, Palladian Basilica in, in Vicenza. 
Um, we are interested in the, in the mistakes that are somehow promising, that are somehow productive. The, uh, the world is full of uh, stupid architecture, of architecture that uh, is, uh, is, is simply um, ignorant. Um, but, uh, but we think there is still the possibility of recognizing uh, some sort of heroic mistakes that uh, uh, tell us about uh, the idea that they confronted with the challenge that was too big to be, to be solved, you know, to be uh, confronted with. Uh, as I was saying, the call for papers is one of, uh, of the core elements of our magazine. Um, being a magazine that is uh, based on a collaboration, it is very simple. Uh, it's, the, the structure of the magazine is uh, almost like uh, the one of, uh, of, of an archive. You have articles, titles, articles, uh, text, images, uh, uh, without any, let's say, um, without uh, changing from page to page the structure of, uh, of the book. And the call for papers, which is uh, normally at the end of the magazine, so in uh, different color of pages, uh, announcing the title and, uh, and the topic for the next issue, is, um, is, is a very specific kind of call for papers. It's, uh, it's quite detailed. Uh, it contains part of text that is detailed and precise, and uh, at the same time, other parts that are totally loose and open to interpretation. But it's not just an announcement of, of a topic. We want to elaborate on this topic. And so we present uh, quite a long text that uh, uh, tries to frame um, the, the space for a possible discourse on architecture. So we present together with the with the general uh, presentation of the topic, we present uh, a number of uh, case studies that can be uh, read, that can be employed by, by the contributors, but they can also uh, propose new ones. And uh, our call for papers is uh, uh, always, I would say, not neutral. It's, n it's never neutral. It's always uh, an assumption of a position, of a clear position uh, of our idea about, uh, about architecture. So, for instance, uh, in, in this call for papers that we called Fact Concepts uh, Context, in which we wanted to criticize the, 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 the expanding uh, um, uh, tendency of uh, justifying uh, arch architectural choices through the use of childish, childish concepts, you know, of, uh, uh, silly concepts uh, as uh, architecture, as if architecture should be explained or justified or uh, presented with uh, an everyday language. No, so this idea that uh, architecture is a language in its own that uh, uh, should be translated uh, in order to make it accessible to everybody. Uh, we we don't agree with this. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't. We want to fight this. <laughs> um, this, uh, uh, this tendency, and we want to state that uh, we believe that architecture is, uh, is not a message in itself. It can be filled with messages, but in itself is, is, is like a bowl. It, it can contain. Uh, architecture for us is a matter of working with space. It's a matter of transforming the space, of alterating, uh, boundarying the space, and so on, and, uh, and so content uh, comes after, or comes together, but uh, in a separate manner. Uh, so um, we, ca we can't avoid to express our preferences, and in this case we, we propose the list of uh, uh, top 25 conceptual disasters and top 25 contextual masterpieces, and this for us for sure one of the, concept, the, of the contextual masterpieces opposed the conceptual disaster. And 
Sometimes then the finished uh, issue uh, takes a form that is uh, very loosely related to the call for papers that we proposed, uh, depending on the, on the submissions that we have. Um, now we normally have uh, 70, 80 submissions uh, uh, of abstracts for, uh, for uh, each uh, number of each issue of the magazine, and we choose normally 20 of them. Um, so the relation between the finished product and the call for papers could be very ambiguous, uh, sometimes even awkward. Uh, here as a cover we have uh, the Vasari Suffizi because he, he also had uh, somehow a conceptual problem to solve with his architecture, the, the conceptual problem of uh, somehow demonstrating the renewed power of Cosimo de' Medici, but he did it in a totally uh, contextual and uh, architectural manner, connecting uh, the square to the Lungarno, through the offices, and so on. And, uh, and this is, we always have a second, uh, sort of second cover, um, and this was the second cover of uh, Fat Concepts, and it's uh, the, the Brugge Terminals uh, model, a very strange Zebrugge model of, of OMA, that was left abandoned somewhere in the basement of Villa da Lava, and uh, we found this very nice picture in which uh, it's, uh, it's very close in shape and size to the basket uh, there. Then we have scary architects because uh, we, we think that uh, uh, we, we cannot lie, and uh, architect, architects and architecture is intimately scary. Uh, why it is scary? Because uh, in, it introduces uh, in, in our life a lifespan that is longer than uh, w what we can uh, normally uh, stand. Uh, there, there was, uh, in contemporary architecture, there is this tendency of having uh, buildings that are lighter and movable and uh, that you can construct and deconstruct in a few years, but still, a long time span is a character of, <laughs> of, uh, of all the architecture, and, and so it confronts us with, uh, with death and with destruction. Well, um, this ambiguity between San Rocco as a collaborative project and San Rocco as uh, a magazine um, was uh, somehow explored uh, in the last Biennale of Architecture, when we, was, we were invited by David Chipperfield to, to propose a project. I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was the first time that a magazine board was invited to, to participate in the Biennale, but uh, so we were in this condition of participating as a magazine board, but at the same time as a collective of architects and so on. So uh, what we decided to do was to, to propose to uh, publish our next call for papers for an issue called collaboration uh, in the form of a three-dimensional call for papers. So uh, a table, a huge, a large table, uh, 15 meters long, full of objects that uh, represent the, the case studies we wanted to talk about. So the table was full of models, drawings, pictures, and so on. And uh, very immodestly, we we put our projects together with projects of the past that we, what we, that we like, that we admire, uh, and that are relevant for this topic of collaboration we are talking about. Um, we think that uh, architecture is, uh, is a collective knowledge that is based on collaboration and it is based on uh, the relentless uh, um, work of a, of a multitude, you know, of a silent multitude, silent or not silent multitude, that uh, uh, in which uh, two forms of collaboration uh, normally uh, are developed. So one collaboration is a synchronic one when you have to collaborate with somebody uh, at the same in the same time, uh, at the same moment in history, and this this results in uh, in collaborative projects that we all know. And uh, one other form of collaboration is uh, collaboration through time, so a di diachronic one. And somehow we think that uh, synchronic, 
collaboration are based on diachronic ones. So we can collaborate if we can uh, agree on something. And this agreement is on the basis of uh, uh, the knowledge we have uh, from the past. So um, the idea of collaborating was for sure more, uh, more common, more normal when buildings took more than 20 years to be realized. Uh, when you had uh, the idea of, uh, necessity to, uh, of the necessity to collaborate with another architect because uh, somebody <coughs> began uh, a work and somebody else finished it. So you have uh, a series of tactics that uh, are implied in this process um, that uh, uh, makes, uh, uh, make the, the, the project of architecture uh, strategic in this sense from the, from the beginning, from the moment uh, zero, no? when uh, somebody is beginning a, a project and he, he already thinks that someone else will, will, take, uh, will take it after him. And also uh, the constructors and also, um, well, if we, if we go, back uh, really far, we think about uh, uh, the San Pietro story, no? when, uh, uh, when Bramante, Michelangelo, Giuliano Sangallo and so on uh, had this uh, uh, work to do uh, all together through time. Um, so this was the, the issue that we finally published, uh, Raffaello and Giorgio in a collaboration on, on the same painting of the, the Venus. And, and then copies. Well, uh, in the same Biennale, we were also, uh, let's say, sub-invited by, by San Jacob uh, to participate in his uh, um, micro-exhibition about copies. So we, there we found the opportunity to finally start with our, uh, uh, our project of the book of copies that we had in mind since a long time. The book of copies is the idea of a book uh, containing images that you can copy in order to, pro to produce architecture. You can literally copy them. So it's, it's diff different from citations. Uh, it doesn't have this uh, intellectual relation to the, to the masters of the past. It's just about copying. And these books are made of packets of A4 photocopies in black and white that we uh, collected inviting uh, uh, architects uh, are, and critics around the world to contribute. So we had uh, for the Biennale uh, 70, 70 book of copies ready. So b this book of copies are um, again for us the expression of the, of the idea of a, of, of a collective knowledge about architecture, a knowledge that uh, that is given, is shared, because it's represented by all the architectures that were ever built or designed through, through history. Um, so then the book of copies is now traveling. It has been at the AA. Every time we, we move it, it collects more copies and more copies. And uh, this, is a, this is the copies altogether. And now this is a mock-up, not, not really a mock-up, but uh, uh, a first attempt to, to publish all this uh, well, the current state of uh, the collection of copies that we have made. We have, uh, uh, we have these five books so far, and uh, each book is, is containing a, class of uh, a number of classes of buildings. So um, you have uh, yellow houses is the book with figures that you can copy in order to produce yellow houses. You have prisons book with figures that you can copy in order to produce prisons. But, uh, the book of prisons doesn't necessarily contain prisons. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's the final result, the, the class of building that, uh, that we are uh, writing on the book. Um, then I have the impression that uh, the activity of San Rocco expanded in many ways and uh, we are always trying to find a way to three-dimensionalize the content of the magazine. We organized a summer school in Genova last summer and uh, we published more issues in difference is one of them. 
This is the last one, what's wrong with the primitive, uh, primitive hut, that, uh, uh, whose main topic is to criticize uh, this uh, um, an incredible idea of uh, Abbot Loger that is at the basis of contemporary architecture in which uh, a man alone uh, builds his own house, uh, his own shelter uh, to protect himself from the rain. It's, it's this uh, like sad, uh, boring story of uh, a man acting alone. No? Uh, we cannot buy it because we, we, we believe uh, that uh, language and fire and collectivity and the city came before uh, this um, uh, totally um, totally uh, opportunistic view of, uh, of how the architecture, architecture began. And then, the, as a last thing, another way of um, proposing our call for papers is through a trip this time. So uh, this year is the anniversary of, uh, of the death of uh, Donato Bramante, that was that died in 1514. So uh, we propose to do this trip. It will happen between 9 and 14 of June this year. And uh, what Bra Bramante left us is a, is a bunch of buildings uh, that are distributed uh, through north, central Italy and Rome. So we will have this tour visiting all the buildings that he left. And uh, for the end of the year, um, we invite uh, uh, all the participants in the tour to contribute to the issue that will be called Happy Birthday Bramante. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from our last speaker today, Justin McGurk. Right, we're back online. Hello everyone, it's very nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have to apologize for this terrible joke, but um, as the representative of a Russian publishing house, I couldn't resist making a little joke about your, the acronym of your course, 
which is, of course, can also be read in Cyrillic. So let's move swiftly on. This is Mary Kay Wilmers. Who is she? She's the editor of the London Review of Books. And I'm going to come back to her later, but I'll leave that quote kind of lingering in the background. Because before I talk about Stroker Press, I'm just going to make a few comments about the kind of critical landscape generally and also about my work and, and my relationship to it. So it, it's a truth universally acknowledged, it seems, that there's a crisis of criticism. At the same time, I've never seen more kind of hand-wringing about the, the, the state of criticism, more conferences about criticism, more courses teaching criticism, more invocations to critical thinking, all of which suggest to me that perhaps the beast is not quite dead yet. The cause of the panic is supposed to be digital culture and social media, the hive mind, the wisdom of crowds, the proliferation of bite-sized opinions on Twitter, and what I call the economy of Facebook likes. In other words, the idea that everybody has their say. I've been rather skeptical about this over the last couple of years as I'm increasingly asked about criticism or asked to speak about it. Um, skeptical for a number of reasons. One, because I'm not sure there was ever a golden age of criticism. If you put me on the spot, I might invoke Jane Jacobs, Raina Banham, Manfredo Tafuri, maybe this kind of period in the, in the 60s and 70s. But they're not critics, they're not, they weren't newspaper critics in the sense that we see disappearing today. Um, I would also say that there is no lack of good criticism around. If you know where to look, the internet is full of criticism. There are blogs proliferating all the time about criticism, small magazines <laughs> propping up about criticism. Um, however, having made this argument over the last couple of years that actually, you know, crisis, what crisis, I'm starting to change my mind a little bit because, you know, the evidence becomes slightly overwhelming at some point. Only last week or the week before, uh, the main British architecture newspaper, Building Design, went digital, which I have no problem with. Um, you know, closing the print edition, fine, it's, you know, this, is, this is history churning. But you know, it, it was also a shrinking, the shrinking of the, of the thing, the moving on of its chief critic and so on. And it really became clear, you know, if you just look across the publishing landscape now, that there is a crisis. So what kind of crisis is it? First of all, I'd say it's a crisis of the critic's authority. So criticism is no longer as ubiquitous as it used to be in the mainstream media. And that means it's not read by the bigwigs over their cornflakes, you know, when they're planning their, their towers in the, in the middle of the city. That's one problem. Um, and newspapers are certainly partly to blame for that. I'll never forget the day at The Guardian when I was asked for less words and more pictures. Or, or frankly, the day when they cut my pay in half. Um, but that leads me to the second kind of facet of this crisis, which is more, more personal, more, more important to me, which is that there are just fewer places left to nurture the professional critic. I don't mean in schools, I don't mean in courses like yours, which, which are kind of growing. I mean out in the world, in a professional context, places where you are gonna be trained, where you're going to kind of get the opportunity to develop a voice, you know, to, to to write to, to a, for a public that you know is reading, not a tiny group of your associates. That is, that's how I think critics develop. Um, and because of that kind of professional shrinking, I think the critic is doomed to be a member of the precariat. Now, there's nothing new there, as Cynthia's talk illustrated. Um, money is always a problem. Um, nothing new, I mean, twas ever thus, really, because Walter Benjamin lived an incredibly precarious existence. I think in the space of 10 years in, in Weimar, Germany, he had to move 35 times, had to let go of his library or lost his library, uh, lived an incredibly impoverished and nomadic existence. However, the debate about the, the crisis of criticism tends to focus on digital media. And I'm not against social media in any way. I mean, on the contrary, I'm, I'm addicted to Twitter and it's an incredibly valuable source of inspiration to, uh, in, sorry, source of information to me personally, it also has a tremendous potential to spread good criticism 
like wildfire if it catches on. A piece can really, can really find legs. Um, the other crisis is, I think, one, it's related, and it's one of the kind of, it's, it's one of participation, really, in a sense. It's like everybody can have their say, therefore, whose say is more important? So, for instance, take going back to my time at The Guardian, constantly pressured to um, solicit the reader's opinion through the article. And you'll, you'll notice if you read The Guardian how much, how much um, headlines have become questions. You know, what do you think? Give us your opinion. This kind of thing. And then the, the critic is supposed to kind of go into that feed and engage with, the, with every kind of comment. And, and really, it's the critic becoming a kind of solicitor of public opinion. Um, and while I'm, you know, I believe in a plurality of voices, I, I think that is all to the good. However, I'm protective of the strong, subjective voice of the lifelong engaged professional. But there's something else about this which makes me wonder, is, there, you know, is it really a crisis of, of digital culture, this so-called crisis of criticism, or does it go deeper than that? Because um, I had this idea years ago, actually, that, that you know, before the crash, something was happening in that period of, of kind of icons and star architecture, the iconic, when architects and developers were mutually fulfilling each other's wildest fantasies. Um, there was this thing happening where the public and the media were engaged as never before, but not critically. They were engaged in a kind of theater, really, a spectacle. Uh, they were lapping it up, in short. And critics were too, I think, if you look back. Um, critics were trying to keep up with the architects in terms of ever more elaborate metaphors, um, in newspapers it tended towards the more mundane, I mean the less imaginative critics always plumped for the, it looks like an alien spaceship. But in my opinion that form of architecture as entertainment left critics toothless, it kind of stole their thunder. No one cared what a few churlish critics thought when cities were leveraging massive investment in regeneration and tourism against these swooping, whooshing museums. Now, Tafuri warned us about this in the 1970s. Um, and I would say that that kind of globalized spectacle I just described was something that he called, uh, or what he warned architecture was approaching, which was sublime uselessness. Architecture is approaching a sublime uselessness. So all this kind of, all these speculative towers and icon-driven regeneration were the embodiment of what Tafuri called architecture without utopia. And personally, it was kind of in search of lost utopias that I went to Latin America to start researching a book. And the reason was that I'd noticed over, the, over recent years that there was a kind of, there was a generation of architects practicing who were re-engaging in the, in the kind of social purpose of architecture, I would say, in cities where there, were, there was simply una, unavoidably kind of massive social segregation, like this in Caracas, which has probably the largest slum in the world, in Petare. Um, I think 60% of the population of Caracas lives in, 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 formal city, in, in informal conditions. Um, and I kind of went off in search of, of a different form of practice, and I was looking at all kinds of people, really, and people like uh, Aravena in Chile, and Teddy Cruz in, in Tijuana, and Urban Think Tank in Caracas, but also less well-known people, less, less well-known phenomena in Argentina, in Peru, um, encounter, discovered all kinds of, of interesting things, interesting politicians in Colombia. And I realized, going back into the history, that Latin America really had a tradition of radical ideas in, in city making. Back in the mid 20th century, it was really seen as the future by many. And it struck me, this by the way is, uh, Tlatelolco, a housing estate built by Mario Pani in Mexico City in the 1960s, the biggest um, ha social housing estate of its kind in Latin America anyway. Uh, the Ciudad de uh, Tierra Dentes is bigger, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of thing. Um, and this is the Corbusian idea of the city taken to its logical conclusion, built on a scale far bigger than it was ever seen in Europe or in, or in North America. And when it was deemed to have failed, say, you know, by the early 1970s, depending on which country we're talking about. Um, that happened to coincide with, a, with uh, a neoliberal politics trickling down south from America 
which urged governments not to bother with this kind of thing anymore because they couldn't afford it, couldn't build it fast enough, and to just let the market do its thing, laissez-faire urbanism, I, I would say, which led to things like this, which nobody quite anticipated would get out of control like that. And then you, you kind of have a, a three-decade hiatus where there's really not much happening in terms of architects engaging in the, pro in the social problems of the city. And so it was that story I was telling in this book, which I, which I wrote last year and which <coughs> comes out in June, um, telling that story of, of how architecture is, in a way, rediscovered as a tool of, to, solve, to solve social and spatial problems in the city, as opposed to the kind of economic tools that failed so badly in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I'm not going to dwell on this book, just to kind of mention it, really. And one of the offshoots of that research was an exhibition I curated in the Venice in 2012 at the, at the Venice Biennale, which interestingly seems to have come up several times today. Um, not that this, but the, the Biennale itself. And I just I only mention it to, to suggest in a way that, that curating is, of course, critical practice, as you all know very well, and only because I'm coming at this problem from kind of so many different angles as a writer, as a publisher, as a curator. And the idea of kind of dropping this little bombshell in the middle of, of the, the kind of hallowed culture of architecture in Venice was to suggest um, that there was another kind of common ground that architects needed to seek. The, the rhetoric of that, of that whole biennale, David Chipperfield, the curator, his rhetoric was that we needed to find a common ground, or you, rather, architects needed to find a common ground, that somehow we needed to make happy families within architecture. And I, I kind of fundamentally disagreed with that. I felt that actually what architects need to do is find common ground outside of the practice, with, with citizens, with the, with the kind of majority in, the, in the cities, and with the politicians who make things happen and, and pull all the strings. And so um, this is Torre David in Caracas, a 45-story skyscraper that was meant to be a financial headquarters, which was never completed and is now squatted by 3,000 people. It's quite well documented by now, actually, and, and urban think tank uh, of Caracas were instrumental to, to me getting involved in researching it. And we did this exhibition in, in the Arsenal, which was, a, which was a restaurant, effectively. It was, it was partly a documentation of, the, of that building and the kind of social structures within it. But um, as a critique of curating, the idea was to make the exhibition common ground. So instead of going into this kind of didactic space with, book, with a book on the wall, it was meant to be a social space where you would experience the project but it, almost through kind of conversation and food, not just by looking at the walls. Um, and there's no neat kind of segue here in, into the reason why I was invited, which is to talk about Strelka Press. Oh, sorry, another picture of the exhibition there. Strucker Press, a project which um, I started in 2012. I should say that the Strelka Institute is a research institute in Moscow, which was, uh, well, founded by a group of philanthropists, really, but the, the course, the, the kind of curriculum was designed by Ram Koolhaas and others, and trying to get a better education and a better debate about cities happening in Russia. And they asked me to start a publishing venture, and I thought, well, how do you go into publishing in this moment of crisis? How do you do publishing in the 21st century? And I thought, well, let's just go digital, or digital first, as I, I like to call it, uh, which kind of has this kind of promise of print to come, which I quite like. Um, and so I approached a, a bunch of fairly young writers, mostly young writers anyway, and um, the idea was that they would all write an essay, and that we would, and we would publish these essays as individual books. Now, going back to that quote at the beginning, there's so much kind of short opinion around, or whatever it was, by Mary Kay Wilmer. The reason I quoted her is because um, the model for this was really the London Review of Books. And there was really two reasons for that. One, because I love it, and because it's just a great read on a, on a bi-weekly basis, but also because in a, in a period when all literally almost all print publications are watching their circulations nosedive, the London Review of Books circulation is rising. And this is a magazine with like 
almost zero pictures in it. It's just a wall of text, every page. And I realized that there actually, in this kind of era of the Twitterverse and the kind of Facebook like, there is a tremendous appetite for long form writing again. It's this kind of strange paradox. And I thought, well, that's exactly what I want to try and inculcate in architecture again. Uh, a, a kind of one hour reading experience, something that some people can take on the plane and read for an hour on their phone or whatever it might be, or on, on an iPad. And um, again, there's, there's hardly any images in these. I mean, it's not, I'm not against using images. Some of them have them. But like Cynthia said, you know, she said uh, she was res resisting the seductive power of the image. We felt exactly the same way. I feel that there's just such a proliferation of smart images out there at the moment, incredibly dense images, which are becoming almost, well, are clearly text-like in their kind of richness. And I wanted to kind of strip that back and go back to writing. This very much is about writing, as Cynthia said, too. Um, but the length thing was interesting because, you know, if you're going to take away the tangibility of the, of the product and, you know, you're no longer confined by how much space you have or a word count or something, so how long do you make something? That was an interesting, um, these vary quite a lot, actually. But now I, I've got it down to, I think, kind of like an hour's read, so like eight to 10,000 words. And the idea was to, to really inhabit this digital landscape of publishing uh, where everything kind of exists on, on multiple platforms, but it's all there. It's, it's instantly accessible. That's the thing that's so appealing about it. You know, if you, if you decide you want one of these things, it takes you about, you know, seven and a half seconds to get one. You don't have to kind of go and find the bookshop that has it. That's the appeal. I still prefer reading a book. Of course I do. I still prefer ink on paper. Of course I do. But if we were going to be kind of trying to, in a sense, experiment, push, push publishing, forward, um, we decided to not quite abandon paper, but just to take the plunge in a sense and see what could be done with digital reading. And in fact, the platforms are getting better all the time and we're about to reissue the, the first and second series again because you know, the EPUB programming has just got so much better. Um, and you know, reading on a phone, this is something I never thought I would do, but actually you know, people sometimes tell me they really enjoy reading the books on phones in a restaurant because there's no stigma attached to going to a restaurant and looking at your phone. Everybody's doing it all the time. But somehow taking a book into a restaurant or an iPad into a restaurant feels kind of lonely and nerdish. And the, 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 <laughs> I, the idea of your, I mean, I do it. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not you know, probably you do too. But um, someone, someone specifically told me, you know, I like to read the books on, my, on a phone in a bar because people just think I'm checking my email or something. You know, it's like, it's, you become invisible in a sense. You don't become the guy with the book at the bar. Um, and the idea was, yes, so it's based on the London Review of Books, on long-form writing, but also on a kind of iTunes model of, you may not want the album, but you can have the song. You know, this, these are the songs. And we didn't abandon print altogether. We, we still kind of believe in, in print culture. We still have an attachment to it. And this is kind of print residue, really. We made these, these little book postcards. Like, in fact, you made me realize, Cynthia, Log does postcards, too, for different reasons. For us, it was just about having some kind of tangible signifier for the book that you can kind of give out, leave around. If I had a whole stack I was going to bring with me, and because I left at 6 a.m. yesterday from London, I completely forgot to bring them. I was still half asleep. But um, this is the second series, which um, is developing much slower than the first, funnily enough. But So we still only have four instead of the requisite seven to call it a series. But um, I'm quite proud of them. There's some, there's some really good things in these. I recommend them. Um, Metahaven writing about internet memes and how, how, what design can do for kind of protest culture. Aureli writing about austerity and, and asceticism and trying to find some kind of meaning in, in a world where, you know, on the one hand, the government is cutting money from everything, that's austerity. On the other hand, Apple and, and consumerism are supposed to represent some kind of monkish attitude to an ascetic life that, you know, having an iPad means you're like a monk. It's a weird weird paradox. Uh, Belyayevo is one of the original micro rayons, the kind of huge Soviet housing projects in Moscow. And um, Before and After by Alan S. Weitzman explores reading cities from the air, really, from satellite photography and, and how, um, whether that's really viable, this idea of understanding events from, you know, several kilometers up in space and where, you know, everybody has a kind of different pixel resolution and you can't quite tell what's happening. Um, 
And there are a few more to come, uh, soon-ish, I would say, because I'm always promising things that never quite come as quickly as I, I think they're coming. Um, herbs on Dharavi, the slum in Mumbai, essays on scarcity, uh, Bruce Sterling on the Internet of Things. Um, I'm going to, to leave it hanging. I don't have a nice summation for you, but I'd much rather have a conversation with you than, than keep talking, so maybe we can I'll draw that to a close and we can start the panel discussion. Thank you. come up while I talk about our esteemed moderators who will be joining us now. Uh, Felicity Scott, who's the co-director of our CCCP program and associate professor of architecture at GSAP, where she also teaches uh, architectural history and theory. Her two books are Architecture, a Techno-Utopia, Politics After Modernism, and Living Archive 7, Ant Farm. Uh, and Felicity's current book project is Outlaw Territories, Environments of Insecurity, Architectures of Counterinsurgency, 1966 to 1979, which investigates architecture's relation to human unsettlement and territorial insecurity. Um, and Felicity is joined today um, by our own alum, um, Marina, who you heard from earlier, who's a 2013 graduate of our program, uh, where she was a Fulbright grantee and wrote her thesis on evanescent institutions capturing a global democratic imaginary. Um, and today Marina is the Director of Global Network Programming at Studio X, and she's also a doctoral candidate at ETSAM in Madrid. So it's the girls team, um, uh, this panel, it seems. Uh, so I just wanted to begin by um, thanking the organizers for putting together uh, such a great day, and, and also to remind um, some of the audience that many of these people arrived in New York in like August or early September, so it's really impressive that they can um, uh, put together such a great event. Um, I also want to thank the speakers um, for putting a lot of material on the table and for also making a really interesting sort of slice through, or multiple slices, I guess, through contemporary issues uh, related to publication. So Marina and I decided actually that I would make a few comments and then I would um, pass the floor over to her to launch the first questions. And um, so I hope my comments intersect. Might be a slight critical shift here, but um, I think, uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll see how it goes. So I, I did want to stress that I think the organizers are asking um, some of the right questions, like excellent questions. So precisely the question of what questions are currently on the table in the discipline of architecture and which questions might also be asked by and about the field as well as how, where, and by whom. And more specifically, in inviting speakers ranging not only in, in, in their concerns but also in their formats or, or media uh, and uh, with that in their audiences, that they're insisting that architecture has a range, a variegated range of sites, of strategies, of tools, et cetera, through which to interrogate historical and contemporary assumptions and, and of course, stage new contributions, new interventions, yes, to launch new types of projects. So each of these formats, in our case, is journals, magazines, books, print and online, um, but also, as we heard earlier, exhibitions, biennales, research initiatives, uh, we might say also serve either implicitly or, or sometimes explicitly as sites where an architecture reveals the multiplicity of forces acting on it, both as a discipline, as a profession, as a discourse, et cetera. Uh, and we might say you know, that through these connections, it reveals something like its function, architecture's function, within a broader set of apparatuses with institutional, political, economic, aesthetic components, even when they're speaking specifically to architecture. And I really appreciate Mateo's comments to that effect. And these formats serve also as sites uh, or opportunities to experiment, as we've seen, even to speak often to certain notions of disciplinary limits or crises. Hence, architecture, we could say, is given the opportunity to speak differently about itself, uh, to make claims that might not otherwise emerge, or at least not so evidently, um, as in, in buildings, in conventional definitions of the field. But then to state the obvious, each of these interfaces uh, and media comes with its own specificities, histories, ambiguities, potentials. Um, 
So an intervention into scholarly debate is likely to have a very different ambition uh, to the sort of uh, intervention launched on a blog, even if these, of course, intersect and infect uh, each other in many ways. So I might also argue that, given this, this porosity to contemporary forces, that, that architecture is one of the most effective vehicles through which to open spaces, discursive spaces and other spaces, through which or within which to enact critical and political claims. So with a long history of, of interfacing with a broad mix of players and forces, again, financial, political, military, technical, scientific, geopolitical, et cetera, and the many media available to it, again, not only buildings, but drawings, exhibitions, magazines, books, television, et cetera, that architecture's internal disjunctiveness or really radical lack of autonomy can be put to productive ends within critical practice. So the important question then uh, to underscore here uh, is for whom and to what end? So in other words, what motivates these critical shifts and their use of particular formats? Question I hope we can come to. So in the second panel, we focused again on publications and to cite the organizers, uh, publications as sites and stimuli for critical production and exchange. And as examples, our speakers' uh, contributions bring into a sharp focus not only the, the practice of contemporary publishing and its various players, editors, publishers, authors, designers, etc., but motivations, challenges, uh, and strategies that are affiliated with these sorts of projects. So I'm about to hand it over to Marina now to pose questions, but I wanted to make sure that we return to this figure of a, of a project uh, and what it means to design, construct, implement, and we could say sort of deploy a, a publication, again, in different formats and to different audiences. Or to put that in another way, to ask how publications operate as projects among many other types of projects in the field. For magazines, journals, websites, et cetera, don't simply reflect uh, practice or follow shifts in architectural practice in the conventional sense of designing buildings, uh, even when they claim that they do that. In making uh, a type of contribution, they shift the very coordinate or matrix or framework of architecture more generally, even critically interfere with it. So to do so, they have to consider not only their explicit tools, again, like editing, printing, design, uh, uh, you know, where they appear, but also their strategic relation precisely to this larger apparatus within which architecture operates and within which these media are launched, you know, the audiences, design offices, et cetera, all the pieces of that larger puzzle um, uh, yeah, go into any type of decision about how to have a strategic impact. Uh, and this apparatus changes, and this is actually something that I think did come up in some of the presentations, um, but maybe we can also come back to that question uh, of how uh, projects have uh, particular temporalities. Okay, over to Marina. <laughs> Thank you, Felicity. No, I, um, I think it's, uh, we can start maybe with this idea of the publication as a project and mm -hmm. its temporality. Um, I want to link also to what we were discussing in the previous panel about like resistance. Uh, you are aware using the voice of Derrida to use to, to find the resistance. And I was interested in Cynthia how you describe your project as the first uh, magazine being one of uh, reaction, the second as activation, and the third more as observation. And also, Matteo, when you were explaining about why you started the project, was some sort of uh, you were not satisfied with what you encountered in the in the realm of the of the publications. Um, also, uh, Justin, in uh, finding this, this between in between the article of the newspaper and the book, so finding this uh, um, medium or essay. I was wondering what is then resistance. So maybe it's not, we are not anymore in a moment of resistance and our projects are more responding to an addition. So we are not satisfied with what we have, but we uh, react by adding other layers instead of uh, positioning ourselves in a spaces of, of enclosure or trying to position ourselves against something, but adding something else to the discipline. I don't know you, um, could elaborate on that. Uh, I know that also there are some particularities about uh, which you resist, that might be the images, or might be the uh, short term, or the short conversations in Twitter. So there are particular ways in which you respond, but in general it seems to me that 
the project, this is project of publications are very much uh, embedded in the, they are not risk, kind of resisting to the market, but uh, adding new layers uh, of mm -hmm. practicing somehow. So I also had a funny question for you. When you mentioned your guest editors having an ax to grind, um, you know, it's, no, it's, a nice, it's a nice formulation, but, but would we say uh, the, that this meant that you didn't, yeah? I mean, within the way you framed the project? Because um, you put it forward almost like an exceptional condition that guest editors would come in with the X to grind. And, um, yeah, and so it suggested a, a slight shift as though the tone were somehow otherwise anticipated to be a neutral one, which of course it's not, we know it's not, but uh, sorry. Uh, if I was suggesting they had an ax to grind, it's because they, they come to me very much with a singular idea mm. that they're trying to uh, collect uh, a, a group of voices around in order to put that idea forward with some kind of force. And I think that's different from what Law was initially set out to do, which was to observe, mm -hmm. to look more broadly, and in that ob observation, not necessarily saying, well, we're only gonna look at this versus that. So, I, I mean, I think that's the difference, I mean. It doesn't mean I don't have an ax to grind. My ax to grind is that people don't write well enough, <laughs> and that I have to spend an inordinate amount of time working with, let's say, 89% of the authors who appear in log to uh, make them better writers, but I, as I said, writing is, I think, critically important form of communication uh, that we cannot just let go, that there is value in editing, and there's value in making one's uh, voice stronger. I mean, Justin hit the nail on the head. There aren't very many places where a person can begin to hone their voice and have the kind of editorial guidance to do that. I never tell people what to say. Mm -hmm. I try to help them uh, couch it in a language that helps their voice become clearer, mm -hmm. to give them some sort of direction. In that sense, editing's a little bit like teaching, I suppose, but um, no, the ax to grind is, is uh, it just means they have a particular polemic they want they want to put forth much more strongly than Log was initially set up to do. But I find that interesting in terms of observing. <coughs> I mean, the Log 31 <coughs> is, is another guest edited issue that we're working on now called the New Ancients, who you would essentially say are the post-digital, if we want to get into these funny little semantics, uh, who are going back to hand drawing and looking at Bramante again and looking at looking at history a new way. I mean, everything just keeps repeating itself. And so one looks for the inflection that makes it sort of interesting, it makes it new, makes it, why, why do we care that we're repeating this? Uh, why don't you guys take this off? <laughs> well, in terms of resistance, um, I can divide into aspects. One is the aspect of, of production. Um, in terms of, of production, I, I maybe didn't uh, say it, but uh, San Rocco is going to last for 20, 20 issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this uh, for us is a, is a resistance towards uh, the, uh, the, the, towards the, the idea that you can last forever. No? Uh, that uh, that uh, your project doesn't have a goal, mm -hmm. um, so it it can seem it seems uh, maybe a short time, uh, twenty issues. Well, we had this five-year plan in the beginning, but now it's eight-year plan because we found <laughs> out that uh, we cannot publish four four issues every year. But still, I think uh, it's a long-term responsibility that we that we take because uh, you can easily start with a publication without uh, uh, declaring uh, how many issues you want to, to publish, and then after two or three, uh, you, you just quit. Or um, it, it can happen also to us, for I think mainly for economical reasons, but uh, uh, we wanted to assume this, uh, 
responsibility as a project. And also this idea of uh, sl slowness. You know? uh, um, we want to indulge uh, in, uh, in the possibility of being slow and, uh, and use this uh, luxury that we have you know, uh, in, in producing the magazine. In terms of content, I would say that our resistance is uh, made uh, through um, trying to talk about topics that are not so fashionable, uh, but they, they can interest us and they could interest an architect of the Renaissance or, uh, or uh, a constructor of the pyramids. I think there are still topics that, uh, that are common uh, to all architects in every, every time in history. And uh, I think this, uh, trying to oppose a certain friction to the, to the calm uh, uh, flow of fashions is for us uh, our, our way of resisting. Well, to say it before to be we turn to Justin, uh, <laughs> to answer this question, that I really appreciated the sort of structural slowness marked by the gesture of the call for paper being at the end of the current issue. And, um, and I say that because having run a magazine for a long time, you're typically, running three issues, you know, you're working on content for one, you know, I mean, you're, you know, they're all sort of in play at any one time. And so, I mean, I think um, uh, this not only the, really appreciated not only the self-consciousness of the use of the call for paper as a, as a vehicle of collaboration, that it wasn't just an expediency to get content, but it was actually seen to be one of the many components of w what a magazine might do in the same way, you know, I appreciated the way it began with, the um, the black and white printing, the paper stock, the yeah, all of these pieces that are often taken for granted as sort of invisible parts of what the publication is. And so I think sort of unpacking that for us was a really nice gesture to start. But the st to come back to the slowness, I mean that certainly that gesture is a is a form of resisting the rapidity or the 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 time frame of production of something like a quarterly magazine. So. I underscore that at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I also, I must say, really appreciate the fact that both Log, no, not Log, actually, any and San Rocco were both, uh, from the outside, finite mm. projects in the way that Stroker Press isn't. Um, I have no idea how many books or essays we'll produce. Um, on the question of slowness, I mean, the whole idea of it is to be fast but it seems to be much slower than <laughs> we think. Um, but as a, you know, as a force of resistance, which is what the original question was, I mean, I think it would be very easy to say, yes, we are the kind of antidote to the Twitterverse. You know, we are, we are against the short form and the bite size and the sound bite and all of that. But actually, I'm not. I mean, this is simply another layer, isn't it, in a kind of cake of, mm -hmm. Um, commentary and you know as I said I find social media tremendously useful I don't find it a useful form of criticism but I, you know in the way that some people sometimes experiment with trying to kind of string tweets together to make kind of lucid state that doesn't work but I do find it a very useful way for you know spreading the word frankly I mean it's, it's just it's incredibly useful tool and it's there to be you know I think you know it's easy to be pessimistic about, you know, I made some slightly pessimistic comments about the state of criticism today, and, and especially considering I'm in a room with quite a few people who are, you know, aspire to play some part in that, and I think actually things like Twitter are, are your tools, you know, that's just tremendously valuable to you, and um, there are means and, and funds out there if they can be found. I was, you know, I was being slightly nostalgic about, I suppose, how I got the opportunities that I got, and one can only hope that different kinds of opportunities will emerge for, for the next generation. I have a question also about something that work, you were uh, speaking about, all of you, about the question of the editor and the authority, maybe, mm -hmm. when you were claiming that you still believe in the authority of the critic. Um, and it seems to me there is a tension also in regard to the authority of the critic and then the attempt to have a collaborative project. Um, for example, when you were opening this uh, exhibition and you were saying like, 
now we want to invite people to engage in a social space. Uh, also in the case of Matteo, when you claim that we want to talk about ar architecture itself, but also by opening up the discourse of the, the possibility to people to submit um, their proposals, you completely open up like the possibility of, of different voices uh, which would not um, maybe re respond in the way you were expecting. The same, uh, Cynthia, in your case, like uh, having guest editors in love. So how do you see your, your position yourself in, in this kind of tension between being the editor of the magazine and at the same time recognizing the value of uh, collaboration? What, is, mm -hmm. what can we uh, think about that an editorial voice? Do you want me to start? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, so why do I advocate the authority of the critic? Because because of Mary Kay Wilmer's quote. There's an awful lot of short opinion around. And the question, and the thing for me is opinion is cheap. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, I don't really care. You know, what is, I don't care what your opinion is. I, c I care why you have it and how you express it and how you kind of elucidate it. And I think that's what critics are for, um, in short. But you raise an interesting question about this kind of tension between the kind of authority of the critic and then this almost politically correct uh, engagement with a kind of more democratic situation <coughs> and um, yeah I mean I think it's important to have a conversation I think it is important to have a debate and I think it's important to include multiple voices as I said and I think it's it important for people to be able to have their say um, but I do not believe in a kind of even field of I'm not saying that well maybe I am maybe I should just bite the bullet and say I, I do think the critic is the critics voice should you know, rise above the others if, you know, when he succeeds in earning that right, you know, and the critics don't earn that right every week, you know, sometimes they fail. I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if uh, the, the, the role of, uh, of our work is to produce um, a, critical, a critical voice. I know, I know. Uh, I think uh, we just uh, we no we we suddenly felt as uh, as uh, practicing architects uh, in uh, in the hands of the critics no? in the hands of the critics that uh, take your work put it uh, uh, in a sort of monographic issue about ecology and you find suddenly yourself there without knowing what's what's happening no. Um, you, you find yourself into formats that uh, doesn't uh, that don't represent you, and uh, and so your work as an architect is totally detached from uh, from your thoughts. Sometimes, you know, you you, you find yourself in, in into uh, containers. I would say that uh, that don't uh, you, where you didn't think you would uh, end, and and so. Uh, for us, the magazine was a very selfish uh, attempt to construct our our uh, environment, no? the, to, uh, to express the the ideas that are the um, ruling ideas for our practice. We are very strict about it, and uh, uh, we never talk about our project. The only th uh, moment when it happened was in the Biennale, because there was this <coughs> this discourse on. Uh, on the ambiguity between our practice and, and the magazine and so on. But of course we have these two sides to, to uh, bring together and I think that the magazine is, uh, yeah, is used in a, in a very selfish way to talk about uh, uh, the topics that uh, we would like to talk about and uh, we would like to hear an opinion about. And our call for papers is not so democratic, I would say it's not uh, we don't open it to everybody. It's open to everybody, but uh, the role of the uh, of the board of the magazine is to select strictly what uh, what assesses the topics, uh, even if uh, if uh, totally opposite opinion from ours. But uh, in order to create uh, the possibility of uh, confrontation, uh, we need uh, you need to have an editorial presence of uh, of the board. When you asked that question, uh, I was thinking I probably made a presentation that didn't sound so terribly collaborative. Uh, 
but in fact, it's it's extraordinarily collaborative because lo my idea was that writers were just dying for places to publish and that I would be inundated with material for Log. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, I am inundated with material, but a lot, a lot of it is largely unpublishable. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the collaboration with the writers, but I also think there's a quiet collaboration with the reader, with the audience, that um, we, we send Log out and we get very, very little feedback. So I want to tell you an anecdote. Uh, last Saturday, I have a weekend house in Connecticut outside of New Haven. And I was in Connecticut last Saturday and I decided to make a roast chicken for dinner. So I went to Stop and Shop, the big <laughs> Stop and Shop market, and I picked up a chicken and some potatoes and some spinach. So I only had three items to check out. So I could get right out of the store. So I went for the 12 items or less aisle and this guy, he gets there in front of me, right? And I'm like, damn it. You know, I said, no, go ahead. The guy turns around, and he looks at me, and he says, aren't you Cynthia Davidson? <laughs> I thought, who the hell is this? Is this some guy I met maybe at Yale, or I don't know, some guy who lives down the street. I met him at some party. He was an architect in New York. He was stopping to buy some snacks for his kids in the car. He was driving out to Rhode Island. And he said to me, I love Locke. <laughs> and I thought that was the most rewarding sort of collaboration at the checkout counter. That here's somebody who'd been reading Locke forever. I didn't know this person existed. I didn't know that he would recognize me at Stop and Shop. Uh, and, but there was a conversation in the checkout line about something that some of us labor very hard. I mean, I have people who, interns, one of them, he was here today, mm -hmm. he was Felicity's mm -hmm. student. Um, I, I have a full-time managing editor. I couldn't do it without, how, without a whole lot of collaborators. Mm -hmm. But I also think the audience is a collaborator because if they weren't collaborating in paying for this magazine, we couldn't pay the printer and I couldn't pay my managing editor. So it's, a, it's much more than just those of us who are writing it and producing it, but it's also our readers who are collaborating with us in a certain sense, sustaining what we do uh, intellectually, if not financially. We should probably open it up now, so there is actually a little bit of space. Unless, sorry, Miss, I don't mean to cut you off, but um, in case people do have questions from the audience, I can see. Okay, Addison. Sorry, <laughs> you are looking. For um, yes, uh, in in our case, the, the the cover is always the same. is uh, is always constructed in the same way, and uh, only it, it doesn't contain the title. Uh, so I had to show the spreads because otherwise you couldn't see the title. 
and um, and I think uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was one one of the main argument of discussion for the for the first issue because we felt that uh, after after this decision you cannot uh, go back, you cannot uh, change anymore. And in fact, it, I, I feel it characterizes a lot. Uh, uh, our publication to the point that uh, somebody identifies us as uh, these guys of the axonometries, you know, these uh, black and white mm -hmm. axons, and it became some sort of iconic uh, um, image. But in fact, uh, uh, it contains a lot of work because uh, we we redraw most of the of the projects that we publish. So. Um, it's uh, another way of uh, working uh, and uh, putting also some resistance to to uh, to the public to mm, in general to <laughs> offer some resistance mm -hmm. is to take the time to redraw the projects and redraw them uh, with uh, with tools that are the same since uh, hundreds of years, you know, using uh, projections, using axonometries, and uh, trying to understand the measures, the proportions, the, uh, the, the, the measures of the drawing, ha having a, a, a drawing that is measurable. And I think that uh, this is part of, um, it, it began as a part of our working method, and then it became part of our image uh, as a consequence that was uh, somehow not, not expected. But uh, in the beginning was truly a way to, to, work, uh, to work with the drawing. In fact, uh, they are not only on the cover, these axons are, are all are along uh, the pages of the magazine. Uh, there are maybe 15 or 20 of these drawings uh, uh, every, every issue. And, uh, I can say it's a, it's a, it's an effort. It's a, it's difficult to remake them, to find the materials, to redraw them, and so on. So, in my opinion, uh, our cover contains uh, the idea of uh, that 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 is not easy to use an image. That you, you don't easily put an image on the cover, but you produce it, you work on it, uh, you you finally choose which one among the drawings you produced uh, is, uh, is suitable for a cover. Mm. So you don't collaborate with graphic designers? No. no. We, uh, we have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, um, I mean, we redraw most of the, of the, of the projects uh, with, with my office and with the office of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the graphic designer that is so internally in the board designer. of, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you say that in choosing the axon form, you were saying that this is an eminently architectural magazine. I mean, it's not that easily accessible a drawing other than a sort of seductive graphic mm -hmm. for the non, uh, well, I, I would say the that person the who doesn't have the eye for the axon. Mm. Yeah, uh, axons also became fashionable no, in the last <laughs> years. <laughs> what doesn't become fashionable? <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe we'll shift to renderings. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're a bit down. <laughs> I have a question for you, Justin. I'm well, sorry, I don't answer that one. I yeah, think that was ahead. a great question, actually, because it was a, it was a, the, the question became about graphics, but be began about reading as entertainment. Mm -hmm. And um, since I'm the kind of digital uh, publisher here, I mean, the funny thing was a couple of years ago in the kind of early days of ebooks, everybody was kind of predicting that the reading experience was going to morph into this multimedia mm -hmm. thing, you know, that, that iPads would be all about, you know, the book would effectively disintegrate into a kind of multimedia experience full of embedded video stuff. And in fact, I mean, we were highly resistant to that. So while on the one hand, we're playing the kind of neophytes pushing, you know, digital publishing and so on, like we're very, very protective of the reading experience as a very traditional experience, which is probably never going to change, I hope, uh, of a sequence of words on a page, a kind of wall of words. Um, and you know, in, in a kind of little subtle detail, which I feel links me to you, Matteo, um, you know, the font on the front of the books is also a highly traditional font, which was created by, it's called Lazursky, and it was created by a guy in the, in the kind of Soviet typography institute, 
uh, called, which was called Polygraph Mash. And uh, it was a font inspired by a 16th century, a 16th century Italian font. So it's a kind of Renaissance re-emerging <coughs> in kind of Soviet Russia, re-emerging in kind of 21st century London is a nice kind of historical thread. My question was actually a really simple one, just around this question of interface and audience. And, um, and it was whether, I mean, this beautiful idea that digital first in fine print later, whether the graphics would shift. And I wasn't also sure whether the format that you would have on your you know, iBook, iPad, was the same as the one that you read on your phone, or if there's actually a translation in these graphic formats across the different interfaces that are imagined for it, these books. Precisely for those reasons, it's incredibly difficult to design ebooks in a beautiful <laughs> way because they have to be flexible to, you know, you can change the font size if you want. Mm. So what happens to the whole graphic layout if you change the font size? Well, it, it just horrible things happen, frankly. <laughs> um, and I, we, no one has quite got around this problem yet. Um, but essentially, yes, it looks the same on the phone or an iPad. But the digital first thing, we didn't want to do traditional publishing, print publishing for, for many, many reasons, but we are now doing it, actually. We're about to launch a print-on-demand edition of all of these books so that if you want one, you can order one, a printed little paperback, lovely little thing. And we don't have to print 3,000 in advance and you know ship them to bookshops. You can just have one, or you can have 10, or whatever. And that, to me, is a kind of continuation of in a way, the idea of digital publishing. And I think I've been promising it for at least six months now, hopefully, hopefully next month, let's see. But see, there's another way to do that, which is that Log and Any have always been only print, mm -hmm. but now they're both available PDF. digitally mm -hmm. as PDFs on JSTOR. Yeah. So that there's, they're being archived digitally, so to speak, as PDFs. Jacob, um, one of the first initiators of the interpretation series, I'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a question about, uh, it's largely been a discussion about form of, you know, we have a, a curatorial panel, essentially kind of an editorial panel, <coughs> but very clearly all of you presented things that fell outside of the, all of you have talked about conferences or exhibitions or other modes of practice, um, as did you guys uh, outside of exhibition practice. And so I'm wondering if uh, how if, the, if you're thinking about the relationship between con uh, uh, content and form of, of content has changed over the years. How you if you've had a sort of uh, consistent or persistent agenda that the form of that its manifestation has changed. Or I know it's a back and forth, and that's like CCP is a lot about you know the mm -hmm. relationship between what's said and how it's said in our country. But uh, I'm just curious if you're since you all work in various media. Well, first of all, I really want to go on the Bermonti tour, and I'm really upset that I can't go. Um, that's a, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of that stuff already, but it would be great to go with the San Rocco guys. Um, I really think I've only operated on two platforms, the conference and the printed publication. And the conferences were audio and video recorded, and when we did the Any Project, and then transcripts were made, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all kinds of forms of, of um, text, shall we say, versus writing. So there's text, 
and there's writing. Uh, when we did the 10th anniversary conference for LOG last fall, um, we had a great debate among the three or four of us that are in the LOG office last year as to whether it was cost effective. I mean, it almost comes down to money. Um, uh, my managing editor at the time, who's since gone back to graduate school, thought it was absurd that I would try to raise $45,000 for a one-day event. That what could we do with that $45,000 in terms of, ex you know, I don't know, printing color, hiring another assistant editor, whatever. I still really believe it's important to bring people together face to face, that the, the social networks online aren't, aren't enough. And clearly there's people in the room who think so too, that it's really valuable to come and be able to bump into people, meet new people face to face and find commonalities and disagreements and so forth. But I think that's all part of the material we work with. And uh, to be honest, what we're now exploring is part of the Anyone Project, which is what I call the Anyone Corporation these days, just to, in my own head. The Anyone Project, which does log and does the writing architecture series books, is that we're now investigating the possibility of, of raising money to have an exhibition space because we, we think there is a, a void that we can do something in, in, in New York. So it's interesting to, to you know, see what Mateo and the San Rocco guys have done with, with exhibitions. So that there's, there are multiple platforms, and whether it's digital first, print after, or whatever, they're, they're always, they're constantly shifting, and today's culture allows us to constantly shift, mm -hmm. which I think is mm -hmm. useful. Well, for us, uh, being on, on different platforms was not uh, what was not uh, planned in the beginning. No, uh, we didn't. Uh, we we always wanted to have uh, the magazine, printed magazine, as the, the core of all the projects. And uh, then, since uh, one one of the early issues, we felt the need to push the boundaries of the contents of the magazine outside of the the, the, the pages. So we started to organize small exhibitions, for instance, about islands. Uh, when we published an issue about, the, uh, about islands, uh, like one, two months after, we organized a, uh, a small exhibition in Milan uh, in, uh, in a gallery, in a project space of artists in Milan, where we simply added more content. We, uh, we brought the contents of the magazine into the exhibition space and then we added more content. Like, uh, oh, we forgot about this island and this island and the picture of uh, Ettore Sozzas of the, the clips uh, and uh, gelatin. Uh, so the, uh, it started to be a mix of works by architects, by artists. Uh, uh, there was a work by Carmelo Bene. Uh, so. Uh, it became a, a more heterogeneous and uh, um, and uh, maybe it, it was an interesting attempt. Uh, we we risked to to lose the control of it, uh, but then we found out that the magazine could be the the platform. The magazine is the platform on which all the other activities are based. So the exhibition in the Biennale, the summer school, they all have then a feedback on the magazine. Lastly, the Bramante Tour will constitute the, the main, um, the starting point for the collection of contributions for, for the magazine. So you always have a magazine as a repository of uh, all the things that happened uh, on the di diverse platforms. Um, and that's it. Uh, oh, we also have a digital version of the magazine now, but it's totally <laughs> the same of the printed version. Uh, just uh, we we don't we cannot afford to reprint uh, the, the paper uh, version another time. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good question. I, I think the rise of the word platform is something that I often think about, and I think we have to be aware of where it's coming from. It's coming from Silicon Valley and uh, this kind of world of, of open software and, and social media and so on. And I think it, it has all kinds of strange political connotations, which I won't go into now. But what I will say is there's a commercial answer to your question. <laughs> good, good. The panel is growing. The commercial answer is that you'll find more and more magazines 
doing events. And there's a simple reason for that, and that's because it's becoming harder and harder to sell advertising. What, what advertisers want now is to be seen as kind of producers of content, not sitting as next to content. So that's a weird kind of dynamic. Um, but if I speak personally, I would just say that my chief interest in those different media is just to bring out the most of each medium. So if you're doing writing, it's about writing. And if you're doing an exhibition, try and make it, you know, I personally try and make it as much of an, ex of an experience, an experiential thing, and not a kind of book on the wall. Do you see what I mean? So it's a kind of, and if it was a talk, you know, my dream is to be able to stand up with no notes and just talk. I'd love that. So, a uh, nice question to segue into the final panel, given that uh, questions of exhibitions and print media are coming together here. So, we're going to minimize coffee breaks and maximize the final reception. <laughs> um, but also, because I thought the conversation was so nice that, it w that it, it, it's, it's nice that this, the, the CCP team has created such a uh, spectacular group of people that it's much nicer to keep that conversation rolling than kind of segment it. So I, I sit in the, but I sit in the moderator's corner. <laughs> um, I suppose I want, I, I suppose I wanted to redirect the conversation just a little bit in the sense that uh, this word shift seems to me the sort of politics of the word shift need to be thought about a little bit because shift implies a small movement. Shift is not a jump or a leap. It's not a flip. It's not even a twist. It's a kind of small movement and, and from one place to another. So it's a shift in position, which, is, which Im, implies a single landscape on which these shifts occur, even if the landscape is the thing that's shifting, right? Like an earthquake and so on. Even then, shift would be not a big earthquake, like not Chilean <laughs> sort of size. Um, and so I guess the, the the kind of question I want to ask is about, the, is about to the ex extent to which you all feel you might be occupying exactly the same landscape. So you're kind of moving around that landscape in, in a shifty way, sh small shifts. Um, <laughs> or to be a bit more pointed, it seems like there's less than 0.5 degrees separation between all of you, right? Um, there might even be less than 0.5. I'm, we'd have to do the calculation, which of you has never met the other ever before or ever been in the same landscape, right? So then it would be not just small shifts in a shared landscape, but really small shifts in what might be a very small, small uh, landscape. So this is the kind of the beginning of the question. And then just to sort of juice it up a bit, um, you could argue that one of the reasons that there is only 0.5 degrees or less degrees of separation between you is that you're all, you are all in the separation reduction business. Like that's what you do. You make books, you make exhibitions, you, you, you're a connectors, you, you work with media and so on. So if anything, it's 0.5 today and it'll be 0.2 tomorrow. Um, and, and so just what, I wonder if that's the case, and, 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 and what you all have in common seems to be also that the star system, that is to say the synchronization of one set of architects um, and the market is a sort of common enemy or historical point or it's kind of like what you're not about and if, if what you represent is something like resistance, that's the no-no there. Um, so a series of tactical small shifts, um, critical, critical of what ultimately a, cl a, a kind of collapsing or s impossibility of, of making a distinction between architecture and, and the market. Um, so I guess it's a sort of a general question wh whether you think this might be the right way of seeing things. Because if it's the right way of seeing things, um, it seems to me that the kind of work that you do so beautifully, there's a lot more of it now than there was before. In other words, there's a sort of uh, booming economy in um, unofficial, independent, small, micro, 
anti-market, um, critical, theoretical. I mean, you know, th that's really growing, and 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 um, growing maybe at the same speed as cities are growing. So you could interpret this as a sort of um, a military buildup, where our discipline is 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 expanding its capacity to think in the face of an ever increasing an ever increasing problem, uh, right? Or the kind of opposite, that it is itself a kind of market symptom that actually, in a sort of Tafuri sense, none of what you do will ever impact the thing that you don't like, um, number one. And number two, you might all be part of that. So I guess, that, so to sharpen the question is, c can you can you separate yourselves from that star system? Um, you know, c can you can you do it? Do you think you can do it? In other words, is your work critical in that sense? And some of you have said maybe, uh, uh, maybe not. Or to say it another way around, like, what would then be the potential politics of the lack of separation? Like, to what extent could you mobilize? your personal interco interconnectivity, for example, even the fact that you've been brought together by CCCP on this occasion, to what extent can you mobilize that for this bigger project that you share um, and thereby avoid the risk of, um, of being entertainment in the sense of like mm -hmm. super interesting or that's so interesting, mm -hmm. that sort of deadly word. Um, and my example for this would be uh, biennales, of course, where um, the amount of prosecco that passes, that is that is brought to that brought to that place, and passes through our bodies and then goes back into the canals during the during the time is really spectacular. I've always wanted to see uh, uh, the statistics of this, um, but I have this horrible feeling that the same is true of all the publications that one is handed during the biennales that an enormous amount of effort by unbelievably careful thinkers, many of us included, a huge amount of work, micro work, is done in order to be there, to be given to someone, to either just be left behind or left in the hotel room, so as it were, peed back out into the sort of the system, which would suggest that all of this work is, comes to nothing um, and it's not read, it's not really thought about and so on. And therefore the issue of how one would take advantage of the solidarity of all these unread micro projects that go nowhere, anytime, anywhere, sorry. <laughs> but you know, I think it's kind of true. Um, could it be mobilized? And again, I'm sorry, really sorry for the long question, but you see, I think the ecology, I think there is a single landscape. I think we all do know each other. And we don't take advantage of that fact. Uh, we don't archive, we don't keep libraries of all those documents produced by all those pavilions. We don't keep those records for students and so on. We actually sort of allow this to, to sort of happen. And as a result, poten a, a potential revolution, which would be something like what happened to newspapers, isn't happening in our field. In other words, this in incredibly hierarchical system with a few little stars at the top synchronized to the market and an enormous army of people who claim to be opposed to that but in many ways are part of that. In the world of the newspaper, of course, there was this reversal whereby the micro-connected, informal, pocket, electronic world actually became the the authority, and I'm not meaning the tweets, but really more like um, the revolution in journalism by which you, you wouldn't read a newspaper of record if you really want to know about a situation. You would maybe read it to reflect on it. And I thought in general you guys were all, if, if there is a sort of spectrum from PhD to tweet, <laughs> you're all sort of operating in a zone about halfway up that line, just short of a fully fledged book. <coughs> Um, but just longer than a long essay. Like, you really kind of uh, have found a sort of sweet spot, and I'm just, you know, so it's, in, it's such a long question that you're not going to be able to answer it. Um, <laughs> but is there some truth to this? In other words, like, 
now that you all know each other and like each other, uh, etc., what could be done with your collective capacity, do you think? Or have you been involved in attempts to link, link these up? Because paradoxically, a lot of our work, I mean, I'm one of you, right? A lot of our work involves writing about people who have successfully linked up, but typically not in architecture, per se, and certainly not in the world of theory in architecture. So can we just sort of go, like, brutally, any thoughts? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and, and <laughs> exactly. Um, um, I should say, uh, in terms of the project at hand, I, I conceived of it as being, in a way, parasitic, um, that it could <coughs> latch on, or that it could sort of have tentacles that would go out to other organizations and that would work in collaboration. Or I don't, I don't necessarily like that word, but but yes. Um, and that was actually the point. So, um, and also the idea that it would would come under the umbrella of another institution. And then I would say, um, in terms of historical precedent, I think that oftentimes um, working within an institution to take a position that is both congruent and not with that institution can often be the most effective way at beginning to usher in in a shift. So, so not not working outside, but sort of. In, in in and out. <laughs> right. Um, I, because, I guess because, but your project, which I love, this, I mean, the, the, the collection <coughs> seem, seems to me um, explicitly kind of counter-hegemonic in its formation. Yeah. It uses tactics of a big institution like MoMA, but to, to bring to light and to remember, uh, as it were, sort of alternative, it produces an alternative, you know, who's who lists. Yeah. Um, but I suppose my question is, if, if that list is, is itself never connected to, let's say, a wider, if, if one, for example, looks at, at MoMA, yeah. sorry, sorry yeah. No, it's no. not necessarily a beautiful thing to look at, it's so embedded in an enormous infrastructural ecology, and it seems to me without a similar Im embeddedness, you, you, you're, I mean, you run, actually run the risk that your project would one day be collected by MoMA. Is like a very and, and do you see that early 21st century <laughs> architectural <laughs> artifact? Mm -hmm. Do you see that as, as, and how do you see that? Well, I, I just the temptation would be to say, but but if it, but if it if it was very knowingly connected to a hundred other such projects, a hundred might hypothetically become a, become an alternative place to seek kind of authoritative editorial commentary on what's cooking in our field. Well, I mean, and, and do, you know do, I mean? do you think, do you think, so it would offer an alternative to MoMA by, by, by not by being within it, but by sort of amassing things or assembling things? Well, no, I mean, I, okay. I, I mean, I like MoMA, et cetera, we do projects with them. That's not, it's like, no, it's I don't actually think that they're the evil empire, but, um, they can be incredibly boring. And oh, that, yeah. that for me is a greater enemy, boredom is a greater enemy than the market, let's say. And, 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 they don't, and actually they have ways of being boring that don't have anything to do with the market. It's not even the crime. But, but, but to, mm, I think our field is very hierarchical mm -hmm. and there is um, first class, <coughs> business class and, and coach. And today we were really, hearing about coach. coach. Yeah. And then there is premium economy, which has developed in recent <laughs> times, <laughs> which is, um, and each is, acts as a filter. Architizer, Architects Magazine. This, th there are filters which appear to be dr drawing on the big coach world of subversive activity, but are actually contributing candidates to eventually be passed on up the tree, right? And there's, there are these layers of filters. So it seems to me to get past those filters, to drill through them, you need something like solidarity. You need like a, a kind of resistance that's at the level of uh, a sort of structural resistance. They're not so easy to pin down um, this more rhizomatic, I don't know, maybe it's just, uh, I'm, I'm asking questions in a way that's impossible to answer. So that's just, I have that problem, you know. No, no, but there, 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 there 
Sorry, I, I'm, I'm hogging the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think they're, I think they're, uh, I just think they're tremendously interesting, par partly because of my, uh, <laughs> I, I have to say my, my, my dissertation, because of one yeah. of the things that I'm studying, because in a certain sense, w one of the reasons that, that there was, a, and I'll say, a, a perceived shift was because of that, the, the power of the institution by working within the institution that you could begin to dislodge it in some yeah. ways. And I'm not saying that that's the only way. I'm saying that it's, um, if, if you put that, let's say, in dialogue with what you're proposing now, it proposes two, let's say, po possibilities. I mean, I think in terms of the, the archive, I was very interested in the idea of assembling these different practices, that's also one way I, I talked about it, to represent different positions and therefore to create solidarity. So if you think of you know, San Rocco coming into the archive, well, what would really come in? Is it just the journal or is it the fact that there's an affiliation with the journal and then there's an affiliation therefore with the exhibitions and the objects that they do and that this begin, begins to, you know, yeah. I mean, maybe this is a good excuse to move the microphone because I think this the quote of Derrida about about, which was very thoughtful, I guess, about about again, operating inside the market and making one's relationship to the market the nature of the work itself, which for me is it, it it's the tr more Trojan horse mm. view, and I think, for example, to the to the extent that all the work we saw today, which represents actually an enormous amount of astonishing research going on in architecture. I mean, there is just unbelievably careful work going on, and brilliant websites, NGOs, everywhere in the world. I mean, just ast astounding creativity by new essentially by a new generation. Um, and it seems to me if, if that generation thinks of itself as being inside the system, because th I think they structurally are, it's all goes, it's all, they're all, all connected to galleries, museums, foundations, you know, Russian billionaires, whatever. There's all these ways in which one is hyperconnected. If one accepts that, one could then, be, you know, try to say, in which way will I be a Trojan horse? Shoot. You know, there's so much on the table. I don't know if I'll be able to answer or even respond to all that you're that you're suggesting. Um, I think there's there's assumption of an underlying agreement that's very interesting um, and very provocative on your part, but I don't mm. know if it's the case. Um, it's it would be indeed the case that maybe there's a counter-hegemonic principle that unites all of us, or at least many of us. But, um, but that is a very general statement, and the tactics, the practices that we all perform are probably multiplicitous and, and different. And it would be interesting to see where we agree and overlap, but also where we disagree. Um, and maybe, for, for at least from where I kind of come, the conflicts and the tensions, the disagreements would be most productive to think right. about. I, like you, I'm interested in solidarity, yeah. but I'm not convinced that what we need is some major shift, that all of the solidarity should somehow bring us together to perform this major cataclysmic shift that will put an end to all subsequent need for shifts. Yeah. I, I, guess I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm more interested in a, 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 a minor, a concept yeah. of the minor shift, um, and maybe the shift as it was so delicately and subtly articulated here that's plural, so it's not one, it's a process, it's a continual process, and that process, as I was saying, indeed is an institution, a process that has to implicate and involve institutions, but it's fundamentally a, a, an individual kind of process of um, negotiating one's subjectivity, one's relationship. Um, we have this, uh, this book on evasiveness that we put out a few years back, a conference um, like this one, and, um, and one of our you know, friends, Eduardo Cadaver, writes this beautiful essay on um, Emerson's Man the Reformer, this essay in which Emerson struggles with this question like in the 1800s and says that as he's trying to put off, push off from the shore, he realizes he still has, he has to have a foot on the shore. Right. And at the moment that he's trying to change the society, he also has to come to recognize his own implicatedness in that yeah. society. And um, so I don't know, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't well, have I know, I know the questions are very crude, because, especially yeah. because one of the reasons today was very beautiful for me was uh, all of you have actually multiple practices and multiple layers, and, and part of what the presentations were today was to sort of take us through different layers, which were sometimes chronological, like Cynthia going through the layers of, and, and for other of you, there are, there are always these, you know, kind of parallels. So I suppose my question is more to do with whether there are 
parts of your practice that you think could be strategically connected to other parts or at least uh, be magnified by other projects? Because obviously each, each of your projects could be thought of as a mag potential magnifier or promoter or repackager or whatever of another part of your project. And even if it's a kind of rainbow co coalition model, you know, because of course the risk is the kind of Republican versus the Democrats that if you really respect difference so deeply, you get wiped out every time by a group of people who pretend not to. And I, I think there's that that, that sort of uh, danger in the in the in the kind of star system as the kind of one point of real agreement. Like that's just not good. Um, anyway. Do you want to hit one more time or just um, keep, keep moving on? I mean, I think the challenge would be to do that, but also to figure out a way to create a framework where we could also maintain our disagreements or even our non-convergences. Right. Um, and um, I don't know, if I, again, I, I guess I don't, I don't feel like there has to be some destination that we have to, <coughs> to, to the work towards or some way that all of our differences have to be inevitably reconciled. But I also maybe, unlike you, I'm not, I'm not the dean of a school of architecture, so yes, yes. so I'm, you know, so um, no, no. I mean, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be received in an architectural community and for the projects that I've undertaken to be perceived as addressing and hopefully implicating in some productive way for others, not just for myself, the field of architecture. But I primarily am not running an organization that let's say, defines itself in a particular disciplinary formation. Right. So I also, as much as I would look forward with an admiration to collaborating yeah. with everybody in the room and on the panel, at the same time, I, I guess I'm, my urgency is not necessarily addressed to the field of architecture yeah. in particular. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. But you would be, of course, a great dean, the, the, as, as like everybody else, because that's another curatorial job, because a, a part of the structural implication of these apparently informal practices or ca counter hegemonic practices is that of course th you know the way the ecology works is always to draw from those practices so we are as it were the fodder both as individuals and uh, our project uh, we sort of feed this you know uh, even just in the clumsy way of saying what the star system really requires is is its other it requires a whole group of people who appear to be thoroughly disinterested in the market. And that, that it, it almost creates a warm glow within which, I mean, the radiant glow of the star actually doesn't come from the star, because if you've met any of the stars, you know they're like perfectly nice and ordinary. But their glow comes from the huge number of people who feel like they are not stars, right? So, so, so for example, for you to say, I'm going to be a star and run a school would be a, would be a Counter hegemonic gesture, potentially. Right? Mm. At least a perfect example of somebody with a g gazillion <laughs> projects. Mm. Right? You're the least easily I am, I classifiable <laughs> species here. What, what's your view? I don't know how to classify, but I, I, I'm interested on specific issues and topics and I react and create demands together with them. So curatorial practice for me, I'm, I don't see myself as a curator in a professional way. I, I, I've been, I have many friends and they create exhibitions all the time and they are there and I, I cannot operate like that. Um, if I have an issue, if there is something that is really bothering me, it's my body, it's a, then I go after. And of course, I mean like, um, I think Perhaps in a Brazilian context, okay, I lived in Europe, I had the experience of working in Switzerland, which for me is the extreme opposite of Brazilian context. Um, when we call institutions or frameworks, it's totally different. But just to say what you have in common, I would also agree it's working within institutional and, and against or the institution itself, or against in a way that you're pushing certain protocols and issues. It's very subtle, you know? And um, so it, for me, it has to do with a, a lot with listening, listening to people, listening to situations, and bringing them together, but uh, not in a sense of building a consensus, but uh, what's, what are the conflicts there? 
And coming from like two experiences like EXO, which was really small, early 2000 or to mid 2000s in Sao Paulo, then uh, shifting to a major big platform like this last biennial with such a precarious situation. On the other hand, we were working with the main cultural institutions, with the municipal, state, and federal governments. We were working um, with the main guys. So I was, we were in a very interesting uh, condition that it was so precarious, but outside we were like big. And you, were, you know, <laughs> and nobody knew that. And you had to play it was a fiction till the very last minute to become a fact and then a fiction again. And we were already operating with many different actors. Uh, we w it was about wor working with the market and with the politicians a lot. At the same time, we had this flexibility and freedom to do many things as creators. Uh, so it was very interesting. I mean. Uh, Sao Paulo is a city that architecture doesn't play a role. I mean, uh, it used to in the 50s and 60s and many other Brazilian cities. And that was part of our issues and questions. It's coming back again. How can we operate in different ways? How in <coughs> micro, uh, with micro actions? Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I think yeah. we were already working like internationally trying to bring some voices as much as we could. I mean, we couldn't cope with so many things. We wanted to invite and work with uh, some of you guys and we couldn't make it. And it was such a delicate condition and very intimate. Ver and very intimate. And, uh, and it, this was only possible because there were a lot of people committed to this common uh, issue about the city and that was something new. And that was really driving everyone. The younger generation, I'm 40 now. I mean, we're working with people like 20, 20, 30. Yeah. It was amazing. And then the older guys, so it was the first time crossing generations from really different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also coming from social backgrounds, you know, also very important. Yeah. So we, we have to play with all the semantics and, uh, yeah, yeah. and forces. I mean, maybe, maybe the... the the fact that you couldn't do everything you wanted to do and that you didn't have the money for it like a week before, all of those, it seems to me, are symptoms that that was a much more interesting Biennale than the usual Biennale. Because the usual Biennale tries to, as it were, tame its content by having it all packaged and wrapped. <laughs> so I, I kind of this, this kind of um, insecurity or instability of, of the Biennale, for me, was, the, was what, why it was always great. And anyway, the things that you didn't show, somehow they are in our imagination because you th said you were going to show them and then you didn't so and what we think of them might be more interesting than what what happened and i guess this is the beginning of a question for Cynthia because because <laughs> this you know we had this panel about you know which now you are the victims uh, um, and uh, of course uh, you you know me so i have a bad character so so um <laughs> i think that not reading is very um important actually, or misreading. And, and so, of course, I was very interested in your various stories about your projects and who's reading them and so on. There would be a hypothesis that says something like uh, critical, uh, critical practices don't necessarily have critical effects uh, and vice versa. So, like, so, so sometimes people who, for example, had any but didn't read it or had log but didn't read it, are nevertheless, in the same way of, of, of Leisure's project, very affected by it. And sort of famously, uh, people who make magazines often don't read their own magazine, and nor do their friends read their magazines because their friends uh, think they already know what's in the magazine, and that's what friendship is. <laughs> and, and in a world of zero degrees of separation, none of us would read anything because we would already assume that we knew. We just have to see the black axo on the cover, and we kind of got the point. Um, so I, I'm wondering. Maybe I can make it less less uh, ir irreverent, but I there is also the reader that comes later. Like, like it seems to me the 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 the, the power of the any, which is a really amazing achievement. I think the seri the any series as a series of publications. Maybe at the time I think it had zero effect, and that would be a compliment, not a. It was so tuned in to the discussions of those of that time that you can't separate any 
from the scene that it was reporting on. Um, but in, ret in ret retro retroactively, that archive is one of the best ways to try to understand that period, which gets back to this. If we don't archive the little magazines and the little publications that we leave in our hotels in Venice, we, we are t really undermining the power of those things that might be for another generation or another time later. So I'm just sort of interested in, unlike the guy in the chicken store, <laughs> the sort of not reading, the not, the, how you feel about the not reading and misreading and like, my sense is that, and this was true of that whole panel, that you're so virtuous you would never publish something that you thought was just really horrible to read. I mean, you would edit the hell, you know. <laughs> I, 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 so what about this non-reading bit? Like, does it annoy you when people don't read it, or? Um, Jennifer Sigler's first issue of the Harvard Design Magazine is called Do You Read Me? And I was asked to write 600 words on reading, and I, maybe she asked you, and maybe she asked half the people in this room, because I don't know who's writing about reading. And I thought, who wants to read about reading? Again, I mean, it's just, I think that's incredibly boring. So what I did was I just said, I used to have a column in Annie called Dear Reader, where I yeah. would write about something. I don't know, being in the airport in Geneva, seeing the stealth bomber in LA, whatever. Um, I said that, uh, you know, there's a great demand for readers today, blah, 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 blah. In the end, I said, keep reading because in reading you are rewriting. You are rewriting all these authors, uh, whether it was, uh, I wrote about, I'm, I talked about Violet Leduc, which is very atypical of me, but you're rewriting Leduc, you're rewriting Demiche, you're rewriting Bermonte, you're, re you're rewriting. And that in reading, you're rewriting, and I'm interested in writing, so that's why you should read, so right. that you can write. Right. Right. But I wanted to just <coughs> speak about shift for a second, it's also a kind of shapeless dress. Yeah. So that you can sort of change. An undergarment. Who you are, yeah. right? Um, at least a woman can. Yeah. And I'm sure a man could, it would work the same way. Um, I also wanted to say that in terms of collaboration um, and maybe producing too much to read, I've collaborated with both Tina and, not Matteo, but some of his colleagues at, at San Rocco and even did an event in New York to help bring them into New York uh, when they started. And I'm always encouraging, I mean, uh, much to my own chagrin, I helped Kyle May and Clog after telling him he shouldn't use that name. Uh, I've had another pamphlet, et cetera, et cetera. I'm interested in this proliferation of voices yeah. at the same time when Pier Vittorio publishes a digital book with, with Justin and Strelka, I'm like, hey, Pier Vittorio, you're my guy, right? So there, there is, as, even though there's 0.25 degrees of separation between us, there's also, I think, a degree of competition between us yeah. that we don't maybe talk about, that there still is a proprietary idea that you hold close, that you like to think maybe your idea's a little better. Um, so can I, can I just move that down the panel? Because I think you guys discussed it so well. I mean, it even came up in the, you know, the Guardian's sort of attention to the reader. If, for example, an architect is somebody that offers the client something that the client didn't ask for but wishes that they had and maybe then pretends that they did ask for, wouldn't it be also true that, in other words, you don't uh, satisfy the desires of the client, you create new desires, you redesign the client uh, in a way that the client feels elevated by or transformed by. Wouldn't, wouldn't that imply that for, for when making a publication, you really don't want to satisfy your reader, you want to write in a way that the reader would eventually claim to write to like and so the, the question is, how do you escape the kind of circula circularity of constructing an audience for yourself that then, that then you, through your own formulas and so on, reassure and maintain and cultivate? How do you break, break that? Because it seems to me the, 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 the word market might be a word just simply for that, that ever-tightening cycle. Pe people like you have read critical articles like this. Um, which doesn't seem very critical. 
I mean, so do you ever sometimes want to kind of come up with an issue to defeat your own readers? Like, you'd only have to do it once, right? And then every potential issue from then on is potentially a hand grenade. Like you, you said at the beginning, you, you, you're, you're, and I kind of immediately, my antenna went up, like you were gonna draw on architecture itself, its own and, you know, strengths versus all that other stuff coming from elsewhere. Of course, I just wanna zoom in, in there and <laughs> force you to confess that there's nothing there. Uh, <laughs> but couldn't you, couldn't you would, since you guys sort of religiously believe in architecture, um, if you did, if you did, if you, if you did an issue in which that faith was not evident at all, even in the Axel, that it didn't measure, or there was no project, I mean, wouldn't that um, put your reader on on an unstable platform? Like, I'm just, I mean, it seems to me you're not you're not interested in this, but <laughs> but but there's a risk, right? There's a risk for all of us that we create our audience and then we please that audience because we all want to be loved but we then actually destroy the productivity of the relationship through tightening the circle right mm. i mean that's why it's interesting magazines that kill themselves off versus magazines that keep going right? mm. i'm not saying you should kill it off but <laughs> are you going to kill it off <laughs> <laughs> him <laughs> Yes, we but he hasn't done it yet. They're not there yet. It's self, self giving. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think you have surprised your audience or you have continued to build this audience? Um, I, I, I don't think we have surprised the audience, but I think uh, uh, we somehow created our own audience. Yes. And we do nothing to please them, uh, to please the audience. Uh, yes. Just because I think, uh, well, the, the audience is growing. <coughs> Um, but we have never um, thought about our project as, uh, as a project that uh, had to, to be placed on the market, uh, uh, even if we, I don't dislike the market. I mean, I'm talking from an Italian position, which is yeah. very different uh, from, from here, but uh, we wanted to be on the market, and we wanted to create at least our own little market, which, which is not so different from the one of the, the, the established magazines at the moment. And uh, I would be much more worried if I, if I, if I was uh, uh, in, if I had a, an established publishing house because uh, uh, 20 years ago they had an hegemony on architectural discourse. Now they are attacked uh, from every, every side, from independent projects uh, and so on. And I think uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's a big challenge to challenge, uh, the, the most interesting challenge is to try to construct uh, the, the economy that is fitting uh, your, your project. You know? And uh, we, we did it uh, uh, without, uh, the only thing we wanted to do was, uh, was uh, to be able to do it without uh, the need of, of pleasing uh, any investor. No? So, uh, so we, we sell what we, we, what, we, what we produce and with these sales we, we go ahead, uh, we, we go on with the magazine. And I think, uh, well, this is from the, the, the market side is this. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, interesting to, to get on, onto the market and to confront with, uh, with, uh, with other publishers, with other uh, uh, editors and so on. And uh, we, we had a project that uh, is somehow monolithic from the beginning. So. We, we never had the temptation to change suddenly the, the course of the things. Uh, we, we wanted to be coherent, and being coherent is uh, sometimes even uh, more uh, difficult than, uh, than changing and mm. uh, following uh, uh, the, the events that are happening. Um, I don't. I don't have such a t temptation, I guess, uh, to to um, disturb the. I mean, twenty issues are are so uh, such a small number of. Uh, I mean, uh, such a limited amount of occasions 
to construct uh, your your audience that i think uh, it's uh, it's enough if we if we are able to be coherent along all these 20, 20 issues and uh, also in terms of uh, i think in terms of affiliations or uh, links and uh, uh, possibility of uh, collaborating uh, with uh, w uh, between each other i think there is also again the possibility to to collaborate uh, with uh, with projects that are not here anymore that, that they are not existing anymore yeah. for instance uh, uh, i think that uh, it's it's really necessary to understand who are your contemporaries and uh, i i feel many affinities with uh, uh, with log or with uh, oppositions, uh, with uh, Gregotis, Rassegna in the 80s, uh, uh, and I don't feel affinities with some of my contemporaries in, in, in this, I mean, that are doing something in this time, in this moment. And I think it's also important to, to, re, to have, a, have this line of continuity and understand uh, what kind of, uh, of project, of product uh, you want to, to do now, uh, starting yeah. from the examples of the past, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the magazine is very beautiful, and I would not want you to change it or even to do what <laughs> I'm saying. I'm, I'm just interested in, in, in uh, because I think also you, the, f the, the way you have themes makes each issue a kind of mini conference. So it has kind of diversity built into its structure, but, but if I, was your agent, mm -hmm. for example, and I wanted the, the, your polemic to have to to break to break outside of its own audience. Mm. I would be interested then in in a kind of curatorial relationship to your magazine that would, for example, focus on those relationships that interest you with magazines of the past and of the future. And 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 I, a little bit the the CCCP program is very very interesting. Has can think about those kinds of, you know, how do you curate the curators, um, and as as a radical act, not as a friendly act at all, but really sort of militarized act with a specific aim. I mean, I, maybe just keeping on moving around. The the the. If you take the M McLuhan argument that that each medium is invisible to the people who use it and it only becomes v in invisible in the moment of its redundancy, then what you were saying about wanting to, we can radicalize what you were saying about wanting to have the reading experience, not wanting to lose the reading experience, because from a McLuhan point of view, the reading experience begins with the e-book. The, for the first time, the book as book becomes visible because it's because you don't have it anymore, because you have a representation of it. So it seems to me it, it's not only interesting that you are, as it were, preserving the reading experience. Actually, the reading experience, in, in a certain sense, begins now. That is to say, every word, the shape of every word, the typeface, the linearity, all of these things become, let's say, hyper-visible. So just having gone from Cynthia saying, what, you know, couldn't we kind of try to not have a reader, like that's also an interesting and important pursuit to dislodge the reader. That reader would be dislodged in the case of, for example, the Strelka books, in the very scene of the crime, like reading as reading. So I, for me, there's almost a religi religious, in a, you know, in a fetishistic sense, encounter with the book in, in the electronic medium, you would. And I like where you're going with that, yeah. because it suggests almost a kind of, transcendental quality of the ebook where reading is kind of divorced from the physical book it's just reduced to pure reading but i must say and especially about your previous question i feel this i say this because i also have a bad character and you know there's a kind if of ge it, generational <laughs> i think there's a your, your your question your previous question betrays a kind of generational attachment to difficulty do you know what i mean to a kind of contrary, difficult architecture, con deconstructivism, for example. Um, but I think your first question was really exquisite, and it caught us wrong-footed, I think. And I think you, you may be right, because put everything we do together and all other media put together, and it still didn't have as much effect on the architecture 
profession as o the events of October 2008, for example, which didn't just shift, it just shifted. That, that was more than a shift. I'd say, well, it's a paradigm shift, and I think it's not embodied so much in us as it is in a subsequent generation of architects who, who think differently, act differently, are much more collective and communal than previous generations were less individualistic, I, perhaps. At least this is my hope. I hope that there's more of a shift than you, right. than you suggested. Um, and I also think that, in a way, that question, beautiful though it was, misunderstands the media. It suggests that we're broadcast beacons, whereas actually we're antennas. I think that we're receiving, inf we're receiving information from the kind of zeitgeist and reflecting it almost more than we are aspiring to change anything. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Maybe I'll leave it at that. Okay, but... Um, oh, also I would say, maybe, and again, because the bad, bad character coming out, you need to decide whether um, boredom is the enemy or whether we're doomed to be merely interesting. Uh, no, I'm pretty convinced boredom is the enemy. For, uh, okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, so it's okay for us to be interesting then? Yeah, uh, the, uh, on the generational thing, yeah, I, I certainly don't mind being in a wheelchair, um, um, but f from that wheelchair, my observation would be something like this, that, the, that this, this, eco this very hierarchical ecology, which has a, a few people at the top, and there's a series of institutions, museums, schools of architecture, um, prizes, um, each of which is, there are, thousands of museums, they're multiplying, there are thousands of prizes, thousands of biennales, like all the, infra all the infrastructural elements are, are growing in size exponentially. But they all come to a point, and that point, all those points overlap. So that, for example, I can think of a school of architecture that's not in a city um, uh, in Cambridge um, that would love all of its faculty to be Pritzker winners, that would be like the dream of education, so sort of like er that everything would come to a point. So there is that system, and then there is this vast growing, counter, almost countercultural, small scale, micro, new forms of research, new forms of tactics, incredibly interesting publications, um, and so on. And, and those of us who, who, and all of us are somehow actually participate in quite a deep cut through that uh, hierarchy, right? we all have our um, co connections, but part of the reason I think that, that, for example, Facebook was able to revolutionize Egypt but not architecture, that is to say architecture is more difficult to change than one of the biggest, oldest nations in the world, uh, is, that, is that we still kind of buy into a kind of nostalgia for the informal, counter, quiet, private, isolated, independent, and, and, and interestingly enough, the technologies that we're talking about, the, e, e, the digital technologies, have essentially removed any significant difference between private to public, research, design, publicity, communication. And so in other words, there, there is a, the, the sort of fantasy that the, that the work, the kind of counter work, is kind of quiet work, seems to be not, in, not interesting. And actually, it's high, potentially very loud work, it's potentially much louder. Uh, and I can't argue this in, 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 in any sort of sophistication, but it's only $100,000, the Pritzker Prize. There is no other field that I know of that such a pathetic amount of money <laughs> is associated. You couldn't even do it, you couldn't renovate this room for that budget. So it's a very weird, f you know, it's a field that incredibly devalues itself and then falls down on its knees in front of this pathetic um, uh, 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 award, which is, of course is then routinely given um, in, in, in sort of odd ways. And I think there is a chance, and it's not the, not the kind of complication thing, it's, the thing that interests me the most is a kind of self-confident reassertion of, of expertise. That, that layer, this, this, this uh, you know, layer of counter work that we're talking about is riddled full of amazing designers, people with PhDs, people with extensive curatorial backgrounds, people who are crossing over between art and architecture, like an unbelievably talented group. And the question is how to flip that group in, in, into a kind of more, I, 
uh, I'm sorry to use the word, more dominant role in the self-image of the field. And, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I think we're all f thoroughly in the market. I just, <laughs> just, just not necessarily very impressively, but. <laughs> question that comes out of MoMA really is that it's a not-for-profit institution and it uses that structure in order to do a lot of things let's say one is keep salaries down there's there's lots of things right keep salaries down people aren't pe people aren't reimbursed you know you're, you're not compensated as you would be in other fields it's the example you point to in the Pritzker Prize right. the, the fact of the matter is is that that the museum itself does a lot to facilitate them. It's in the market anyway, even though it's out, it says it, that it's outside the market. And I guess I'm just wondering about structures that can really begin to, to use that. Yeah, well, that gets us back. I mean, that's the Trojan horse. That's the uh, assuming responsibility for your own relationship to the market as the work itself. I mean, that's what that was, I think, the, the point of that quote, right? I mean, can I also yeah, yeah. call you on something else? Yeah. Come turn the tables and yes. kind of speak with some aggressivity as well. Um, so there was the discourse of the n this Fine. radical need to curate the curators. Yeah. There was the need re more recently to, re to revalue architecture and the field. Yeah. Um, and um, why this like kind of heroic, wh why is there this narrative that you've given us that the field is somehow devalued, that it's debased, that kind of um, things are in shambles, that we need to somehow resuscitate the field of architecture. Why this narrative of loss and kind of posturing this, recu this need for recuperation, recovery in this heroic manner that will somehow turn, turn all the tables? So that's your question to Felicity? <laughs> 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 Just trying to move it around. I mean, I can give my two pennies and then, I mean, I think it, it, it would be so so interested to hear from the CCCP mafia because in a way they've, I mean they really have, I mean I, I, mean, I ask these questions in, in, in all seriousness because CCP is sort of pushing this, touching this acupuncture point, it, it, it feels to me like a decision moment about whether one wants to um, mobilize the critical capacity that lies within the field at this moment. In my mind, not because the field needs more dignity or more attention, but the field would be so much less boring were, were these voices um, prominent in their current modality, as distinct from the current uh, way it operates, which is to then eventually select from that world and guide people up, you know, to, to be, you know, to, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's an incredibly naive and romantic thought that that the that the that the counter voice could slide past what is actually a somewhat pathetic opposition, and and I I, I don't know I've experienced in my own life many many times, and maybe I'm my, I am myself an example of this. People are so often think that other people have enormous power which they don't have until people fantasize that way. And so I think we live in a field in which even those regrettable stars with their complicities and their duplicities and so on, even by those of us who denounce that, we give those figures even a special ability to be complicit. Like so, we, so we kind of give them and, I, and I, I, I'm, all, I'm, I'm interested in whether architecture could be, as it were, just, just overnight, as it were, unimpressed. <laughs> and, 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 and unimpressed by the holders of the, of the mantle, you know. Um, and then, as it were, release a generation that I think is profoundly interesting and, and, and pretty connected to the world, and the world and the problems that the world is facing. In other words, I. Part of me does think that um, how the hell we're going to live together in a, in, a, in a couple of generations is a very, very urgent question. 
and I believe there's a new generation has emerged in architecture that, have fu that has the capacity to address the question. And I don't, and I, that's why I'm happy to be in the wheelchair, I really feel there's a, a, new, a new game in town that is adequate. Finally, there's the bandwidth in our field to address some of the big questions. So I'm inclined just to sort of find short circuit to say to that generation, okay, it's your job, go for it. And, and the, right now I feel the generation won't accept that because there is the thought that there's a whole other series of things that have to be done and anyway, sorry. Okay. Not expecting a question to come my way, but um, <laughs> maybe I need that one. <laughs> but you know, I was uh, thinking about the the analogy of um, of the airplane passengers, and um, and it's a sort of very disturbing analogy because, on the one hand, you know, if, uh, if somebody like me has very little interest, for instance, in being the director at MoMA, you know, this would be my last. Um, they, uh, you know, th there's something about business class or first class that, that remains appealing when you travel a lot. And then, you know, when occasionally you're bumped up randomly, with the exception, of course, of deans of schools of architecture, you're often next to major assholes, yes? And so, and so there are, you know, also sort of difficulties <laughs> of, of, uh, of these spaces that, you know, seem yes. to have something else going for them. And, and so the aspiration also comes with risks, I think, and this is, uh, which is, I know they're not the same thing, but, you know, maybe we need to, to shift out of that analogy to begin to think what that overturning would be or what that, that sh you know, shifts, what those many shifts would be. And, and um, I mean, I, you know, it's an old story that, that any form of, you know, dissent precedes and preempts, you know, capitalist machinations and that experimental practice for, you know, decades, if not, you know, centuries has, um, you know, operates like a research and development arm, you know, of the main, you know, this is this is the old thing. And, and um, I mean, one thing that, that I was, you know, trying to think through listening to people and, and a couple of people commented on the repeated um, emergence of the Venice Biennale as a sort of founding institution and why exactly that maintained, you know, something, you know, some form of attraction for people to participate in, yet normative mainstream institution that, that um, at the same time has, um, I don't know, retained a sort of fascination, I think more so than MoMA and more so than other institutions. And I, you know, I don't actually have an answer to that, but, but I do think that, that um, you know, one would have to hold out the hope, and maybe this comes back to Mark's question about institution critique. Institution critique was to some degree premised on the understanding that, that you know, power lay within institutions. And we know now that that's not necessarily the case. I mean, certainly some institutions have power. Yeah. Yeah. This is also, you know, somewhat self-evident. But, but in terms of how contemporary battlefields operate, they operate through tactical positions and moves and, and through recognizing uh, you know, sometimes recognizing precisely, as you put it with the Trojan horse, the, the possibility of, of, of steering what exactly is being preempted and proceeded into that machine, you know, i.e. by throwing in other voices, other questions, opening up new types of um, space within the field, you know, that of course are not going to look like they did in an alternative space, but at the same time they, I mean, you know, I'm just thinking also of these uh, repeated laments about the failure of the 70s, and yeah, certainly, you know, women's movement, these things didn't exactly play out as were imagined, but at the same time, these like, you know, one could also read some of those movies. I mean, they, they were utopian, they weren't tactical in the same sense, but but they had tactical effects. And so for me, the the the, the issue is recognizing, you know, this is why you're using the language of an apparatus, recognizing all the pieces of that apparatus, actually beginning to, you know, learning the skills of, of, um, of, of reading the components, which are the strategic points to put pressure on, which are irrelevant, to, to see the machine for what it is and ask how to play into that machine. And, and you know, when I, 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 I hear the problem of, then being sort of circumscribed within the less than one, <laughs> one degree of separation. Um, but, but um, you know, that paradigm, that, you know, paradigm can create a type of virus that does shift, you know, who, who, yeah, who is within 
the degree. And so, yeah, so I think yeah. you know, there's lots of ways to, to think this through. And certainly, um, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. You know, Maine had this as a historian, and it's exactly you know what I try to do with that that scholarship. So, Maybe yeah. I mean, of course, the, the reason I force the vulgarity of the airplane is that I do think there's a class structure in the uh, organization of the discourse. And there is the offer of upgrades and frequent flyer, and they're all, all, you know, all the dangers, it's all, it, it's all there. Th this very same panel today, um, what interests me is that the CCP students call, called you together, which for me already makes it more interesting, more viral in, in, in character than had the same panel been at the Venice Biennale, which it could be. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me if it's at the Venice Biennale, according to this, you know, pessim actually pessimistic view of <laughs> the way institutions work, it's being sort of patted on the head and, and then asked to sort of move on uh, or it gets excreted back into the canal. Mm -hmm. But there is the possibility with a new generation to actually curate some of the political capacity of this group. I, and, I, and I know it seems like so Neanderthal, but even if we were to systematically keep a, keep a PDF of every significant you know, kind of research project put together by an architect or a collaborative or an NGO or a group, if we really were to do that systematically, there would be tens of thousands uh, so certainly thousands every year, something, will, something would happen, I think, as a result of that gesture that would re which would dignify all of that work without offering it mm -hmm. glamour or anything like that and, and also allow for the explosion to occur 10 years later or 15 years later, or, but at least properly, properly honour um, the work, I think. And, and so I just think that's where the... Well, to someone who doesn't even know what a wheelchair is. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, also, you've never been one because just the way technology goes, it's just going to be novel idea. Well, I, I want to I wanna speak about solidarity and these tactical shifts and saying that obviously it's a gesture of solidarity that I'm here sitting this year. I was a student uh, and organizing an event, and now I have the pleasure of being uh, one of the moderators. So, um, and in that regard, I'm also with a tactical shift and also solidarity wearing a t-shirt that is in the same color as the poster of the event and, <laughs> and the poster of this event has the color of the poster of the event two years ago and we actually have this series of interpretations and slightly there are tactical shifts that go from one year to the other but finally um, Nicolas Hirsch is here and he took part in uh, Promiscuous Encounters, uh, Rodrigo Tisi as well, um, at Mitch McEwen. So uh, this idea of degrees of separation and solidarity and this new type of hegemony is, uh, I think is clearly on the table and in this room. Um, second thing that I wanna say is, I like this idea of, of the books that don't go anywhere and you forget them in the hotel rooms. And I always forget, in, in the hotel rooms, I always forget the things that I like the most. Um, so I'm very happy if you forget the uh, promiscuous encounters, which I already see that you have left them in, in, <laughs> in the floor. And I'm very <laughs> grateful for having like a uh, director of, uh, of the programs and the dean of the School of Architecture that are, are happy to support uh, books that you can leave in, in the hotel rooms and still make uh, a, a difference and, and collaborate with the discourse. The, um, I, the final, one of the final lessons of Marcus Dean is to dismantle the <laughs> symbolic power of uh, figures of authority, which, which is a lesson that he's continually teaching us. It's, I'm making a joke, that's not a new position for him. Um, but, but I think an injunction that we should all pay attention to quite seriously, and maybe one that the program does try to pay attention to, and so I, I kind of want to come back to the question of the institution and reading because it seems like part of that is to challenge not only the institution of the discipline and its class structures, but 
to uh, question the institutions that we belong to in a smaller sense, the universities, the museums, the counter institutions, and, and how we understand how what uh, power is produced in them and reproduced in them and how that can be shifted. Because if there's a question of shifting, it might be how you shift within those institutions. But first, in order to do that, it seems that you need to learn how to read them. And it's not always evident how to read. And so I, I think the topic of the Harvard Design Magazine about reading is actually an incredibly apposite topic because I don't think the problem of reading has gone away. Maybe what we read has changed. And, and I'd say if, if something is shifting, it's the landscape of difficulty of cultural, political, social forces and how they operate through forms, through institutions, through practices. And one has to keep up with that through developing new modes of reading. And, and in part, that's the attempt that I think the program is up to. It's not just how do you read an axonometric, which is a continually difficult problem, but how do you read an institution? How do you read uh, social practice as a form of architecture? Uh, and, and I think that's a continual challenge for us, one that will help us answer the, the, the challenge that Mark posed to us, but also one that I, I'd say we're collectively trying to do in some form of theoretical social political solidarity, which is rife with all kinds of disagreements and tensions, I would say. Um, but so the last question I would leave on the table then is, is not how you've learned to read, but, but where the difficulties of reading still lie. Which institutional practices, which forms are the most opaque to us? How do they operate on us, on us collectively, on us um, individually, that, that require the most urgent reading lessons. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> well, in there with reading. So that was an act of evasiveness. <laughs> I just, well, I just, I should hand over to whichever the CCP student wants to, to close the event, because it's your event. But I think from our side, what's really a beautiful thing that you organized? Can you hear me? Good. Did want to stand in front of everyone. Um, in the interest of time, and because we do want to receive you in the back with food and drinks, um, we'll kind of keep this a little bit short. We do want to extend thanks uh, to everyone who came here today, everyone in the audience, the Promiscuous Encounters team, everybody who joined us today live stream for the first time from Studio X, um, everyone who put their hands into organizing this event uh, at the School of Architecture as well as here at Studio X. Uh, we especially want to thank our distinguished speakers uh, for coming here and sharing this experience and event today with us, as well as putting their time and effort into their presentations. Uh, we also have to thank everyone who is affiliated with the CCCP Mafia. We have our respondents, Marina and Adam, um, as well as our uh, co-directors, Felicity and Mark, and the Dean of the School of Architecture, Mark Wigley. Uh, it's been a really fantastic day of discussion, and I hope you can meet us in the back. Thank you.